Hi, welcome to VQ Book 1, Lesson 1, Video Lecture. I'm going to go over the 10 words with you. As I explain, please take notes in your workbook and try to understand what the phrases mean exactly. Let's get started with the first word, abase, refuse to abase himself. The definition you have in your workbook is to reduce or lower, as in rank, it means somewhat humiliating yourself, putting yourself down lower than the other person. So here we see the doggy humiliating himself. He is abasing himself, or he might refuse to abase himself if he didn't want to do that. So some prefixes and uh, a prefix and a root that we might want to consider. The ones that I put in bold, like the ab, is important. And that is something you want to commit to memory. So write that down, please. Ab means down or away. Memorize that. Base is not an important root because that's a common word. Base is the, the lower part of something, right? So we might talk about how somebody abases another person. Here the cat is abasing the dog or by making him do that. Or I guess the man is telling him to bow. So he's the one abasing the dog. Or the dog can abase himself. So we say someone abases oneself, himself. Attribute. Attributed her success to her parents. The image it seems like a boy, so we might say attributed his success to his parents in this case. To ascribe, explain, or give credit. And this is the situation when you have accomplished something. So you would attribute that success that you did to someone else who has helped you along the way. So you attribute something to another person. Or you can say that something is attributed to someone or some reason, as in this sample sentence. His resignation was attributed to stress. That means stress caused it, and he uh, blames it on the stress. Cryptic, cryptic message. A cryptic message is mysterious or puzzling. Like you get a text message and the words are all, you know, the characters are all jumbled and it doesn't look like any language. It might have gotten jumbled along the way. Then you got a cryptic message or a message that you just don't understand. Then that's a cryptic message. Uh, the word crypt refers to an underground room or vault beneath a church used as a chapel or burial place. So we usually think of an underground tomb where there are coffins and bodies buried in there. And it is puzzling, probably associated with puzzling, because in order to get to the crypt, usually there's a maze, maze-like labyrinth that you have to get through. And so it's a very puzzling and uh, mysterious place. We also talk about encrypting something. When you encrypt a message, you are encoding it. So if you don't want your email messages to be read by someone who intercepts it along the way, the computer program will encode it for you or encrypt it for you so that it turns into a bunch of computer code so no one can recognize it. And that's called encryption. And the recipient of that message will receive it and run a decryption software and that will convert it back into the form that is normal normal language. Ebullient. The girl's ebullient nature. Ebullient nature is showing excitement, right? Think of a person who is always showing liveliness and enthusiasm. We all know someone like this who's always happy, seems to be just happy and bubbly about everything. And incidentally, the root word is bullire from Latin, and it means to bubble. So we can see how the word ebullient has to do with bubbling up of personality or happiness or something. So you don't have to memorize that root. Just try to kind of keep that idea in mind, a bubbly personality. Falter. Her courage did not falter. To falter is to hesitate or stop short. Like if you're diving uh, on a diving board and then you hesitate at the last minute because you got scared. That is 
faltering. So in action, you could be faltering, and that means to walk unsteadily or move hesitatingly, perhaps like a drunk person. A drunk person would falter as he walks. You can also be faltering in speech, and that means to speak brokenly or weakly, maybe because you're shy and you don't, you can't really speak well, or you're afraid, and that's why you're faltering in your speech. Insight. Inside a riot. A riot, of course, is something like what you see in a picture here. Um, a lot of people out on the street getting violent and things, and you would usually need the police to come in and break it up. So to incite that riot is talking about a few leaders of the group who kind of go and kind of encourage other people to riot uh, as a group. And so the definition is to arouse to action, to goad or motivate. And that means that you are causing something to happen. So it doesn't just have to be that you are um, causing something like a riot, but emotions too. You can incite hatred by telling people how to be racist. Then you are inciting hatred that way. Or you can incite fear in people saying that the end of the world is coming. Then you are inciting fear. Or you can incite discord, say, among your friends. You tell, you know, you try to break up the friendship by telling lies or something. Then you are inciting discord. Lurid. Lurid cover stories. Cover stories are the stories, the main stories of magazines. So the cover story gets an image on the cover. So that's called a cover story. So a lot of magazines would use a lurid cover story or lurid covers. And that means it's wild, sensational, graphic, or gruesome. It is an image that is really, you know, not really appropriate for children. It could be very disgusting or violent or, you know, something nasty. But magazines will want to do that in the front, put lurid, talk about lurid stories or put lurid images in there because the more lurid it is, the more attention it gets. And that's more dollars for the magazine. So the image here, The Economist is actually a very boring magazine about the economy, except they will put an image like that on the cover because that interests people and people are likely to look in and see what's in the magazine. Pervasive. Pervasive odor. Pervasive odor is something like, you know, smoke odor. It is pervading, spread throughout. So if one person is smoking inside a building, that smoke isn't going to stay in his corner. It's going to spread out throughout the room or throughout the building. And that is a pervasive odor. You can also have a pervasive opinion. That means an opinion that everybody seems to have about a particular issue. A lot of people don't like Trump then that is a pervasive opinion of in the politics. Pervasive attitude, you can be, you know, people are more accepting of, you know, a lot of liberal ideas, then that's the pervasive attitude of the time. Pervasive racism means that a lot of people seem to be racist, so that racism seems to be everywhere. It is spread out everywhere. Remorse, feel remorse for his crime. Remorse is guilt or self-reproach. That means you know that you've done something wrong and you tell yourself you've done something wrong. So it comes from the Latin root mordere. This is something I had to look up. It's not something you um, need to memorize. It's not a common root. But it is interesting to look up these etymology, you know, the root words, and to see how the word came to be. The definition for this root is to bite. So the idea is that the guilt is gnawing at you over and over. It bothers you. And that, of course, reminds us of The Telltale Heart yeah, by Edgar Allan Poe. If you don't know the story, I'm sure you'll come across it sometime. It is the story of this man, a young man who kills an old man and buries him under the floors of his kitchen. And later he keeps hearing the heartbeat, thumping sound of the old man's heart beating. And he keeps hearing it until he confesses to the police officers, even though the police officers didn't suspect anything. Um, and it is because of the remorse. 
I suppose, the remorse or the guilt in his heart that made him hear and imagine these sounds. No remorse in court. That means some. there are cases where certain criminals seem happy about the crime that they did. They were violent, maybe they killed somebody, and they show up in court and they're laughing about it. And this actually does happen, and you hear about, hear about them in the news, that these uh, criminals don't seem to be feeling any remorse. And if that's the case, the judge or the jury are more likely to give a harsher sentence to that kind of person. But if the criminal who is uh, guilty shows a lot of remorse, says sorry, sends, judge the let you know, sends letters to the judge saying how sorry he is and sends letters to the families of the victims and so forth, then that's showing a lot of remorse and that kind of person gets lesser less of a sentence. Subside. Storm subsided. To subside is to settle down, descend, or grow quiet. So the roots here are important. Sub means under, and sid, said, or ses is the same root in different forms, different spelling in English words, and it means to sit. These are very common roots, so please write them down and do commit them to memory. So subside means to go down in level, sit at a lower level than it was before. So storm could have been raging at first, and then after a while, it subsides. And it we can use the word in a lot of emotion-type situations, like anger. You can say that someone's anger subsided after some time, or the excitement of the crowd subsided. Or we can say that the fear subsided after some time. All right, those are your 10 words. Get back to your workbook. And if you don't have your workbook, please you, uh, go to Amazon.com and you can purchase them. Hi, welcome back. We're working through lesson two of our VQ workbook right now. Let's get right into it. Number one is abridge, abridge dictionary. To abridge means to shorten, and you can be shortening a lot of things. You can shorten the length of a book, uh, make it reduced and condense it, or you can abridge a presentation if you have a time limit set and you need to get it, get it down to fit that particular time, then you abridge the presentation. Or perhaps your sentence is too long, then you can abridge your sentence. So an abridged dictionary is like what you see in the picture there. That is definitely an abridged dictionary where a lot of uh, words are taken out and a lot of definitions are taken out. And they only keep the uh, words that people are more likely to search for. Then that's an abridged dictionary. Most dictionaries that we use are abridged dictionaries. Sometimes when we go to the school library, we can find the unabridged library, I'm sorry, unabridged dictionary, and that will be a big, thick book at the library uh, with thousands of pages, and it contains pretty much every word in the English language, and that's considered an unabridged dictionary. Audacious, audacious attempt. To be audacious means being daring and bold, so you're being very brave, but in a foolish way. So you're doing things that you shouldn't be doing, such as possibly running across the freeway. That is, you know, you might think that's brave and audacious, but it's more foolish than brave, right? If you are sailing solo across an ocean, there are some people who do this, and nowadays uh, young people are doing this, trying to sail all alone, a teenager sailing across an ocean all alone. That is pretty, pretty audacious, we would say. How about challenging a pro athlete? You go up to a pro tennis player and challenge him to a game of tennis. That's pretty audacious. Cursory, cursory review. A cursory review is something that is casual or hastily done. So you don't have much time before a test, so you want to do a quick review before a test. You flip through your notes. That's a cursory review. It is definitely not thorough. 
So something else you can do, you can take a cursory glance at the report. I'm thinking of something like you turning in a, a report that you worked on to your teacher. The teacher doesn't seem interested, so the teacher just takes a cursory glance at the report. Eccentric, eccentric personality. We're talking about some kind of bizarre or goofy kind of person. Uh, eccentric means irregular, odd, whimsical, or bizarre. And if we study the roots, it might help us to understand a little better. X is out and center is center. So please commit those to memory. Please write them down in your workbook. So eccentric personality, we're talking about a personality who is out of the center, where everybody else seems to be huddled together with similar kinds of personalities in the center. This person stands out off by himself out of the center. And this really is basically a nice way of saying he's weird. Fanaticism, religious fanatics. And the definition is excessive zeal. Excessive means too much of something, and zeal means enthusiasm, being overly enthusiastic for something. So basically being crazy about something. So the person is a fanatic, and what he does is fanaticism. What he believes in is fanaticism. And an adjective form would be fanatical. He is being fanatical. So it is too much devotion for a belief or an ideal, belief as in your religion. And this is how we get suicide bombers. Suicide bombers do that because they think they're doing it for their religion and their God. They think that their God demands it of them and they are fanatical in their devotion. So they will be willing to give their lives. We also hear about right-wing fanatics or left-wing fanatics. So this is in the political are arena. When you hear the news, you might hear people talk about how the right-wing fanatics did something or the left-wing fanatics did something. This is a way of insulting the other group um, as being fanatics. Inclusive. From 1 to 10, inclusive. Of course, uh, inclusive means tending to include all, include everybody. And the adjective forms are inclusive and exclusive, the opposite, from the words include and exclude. The very basic words, not too difficult. In means in, the prefix, please make note. X means out. And the clues and clude is the root here, which means to shut. So if you include, you shut in, you include that person into your group. If you exclude, then you leave somebody out and you keep that person shut out. That's exclusive. So you might see a sentence like this. What is the sum of all digits from 1 to 10 inclusive? And they, they would add that word inclusive at the end to make sure that you as the tester will know to include the 1 and the 10 at the ends because some people might want to... Uh, add the numbers only from 2 to 9, uh, thinking that it's between 1 and one and 10. We might also hear about inclusive organizations, uh, inclusive atmosphere, and that means that they welcome everybody. Or we might hear about exclusive clubs. There are certain country clubs that are open to men only or certain races only. And they're able to do that because, you know, these are private organizations and they are able to discriminate. And if they do, then it's an exclusive club. Luxuriant. Luxuriant hair. This is something you hear on TV shampoo commercials. And there's always a, a woman with nice, long, full set of hair. And then the narrator tells you about how great and luxuriant hair you can have. Luxuriant is abundant, rich, and splendid. So it comes from the word luxury, of course, and we get these two adjectives, luxuriant and luxurious. Uh, they seem to be the same, but they're actually a little different. Luxuriant is the word we have here. It's characterized by thick or abundant growth. So it is often talked about uh, in terms of plant growth, trees and brushes and things like that. There's luxuriant growth there. 
the word we would more commonly use is luxurious, as in luxurious lifestyle, being rich, and things like that. That's luxurious. So we have luxuriant growth as an example and luxurious lifestyle. They are a little different, although they're both from the word luxury. Pessimism, pessimistic view of life. Pessimistic means being or seeing the bad side only. Like the glass here, if the glass is half full, do you say it's half full or half empty? The optimist is the opposite, right? A pessimistic, optimistic. These are opposite words. So the optimist, the person, he will say that the glass is half full and the pessimist will say the glass is half empty. A statement that you might use might be something like, hey, don't be such a pessimist. Renounce. Renounce her belief. To renounce means to abandon, to disown, or to repudiate. That means you say, okay, I don't belong to that anymore. I don't want to be associated with that anymore. I am rejecting it. I'm separate from it. So to renounce her belief is to um, reject her belief like her religion. And so here we have some other words that have nouns in them. Uh, I want you to consider like the word announce, pronounce, denounce. These words all have nouns in them. And the more words you study, you'll see a lot of these, uh, you know, a lot of these situations where you have words that, you know, you can think of that are all similar. Then you should look them up in the dictionary and look for the etymology. So what I find in the etymology for these words is um, nuntiare from Latin, and that means to report. And that itself comes from nuntius, which is messenger. So the idea of announcing something is about a messenger coming along and saying something to you. And that could be announcing some announcement, some idea, news, or pronouncing something. Now we our pronunciation is about talking um, sounds, but there there is there are other definitions of pronounce. Uh, denounce is like criticizing something, and renounce in this case is to talk back, take back something, to say against something, and they are all kind of uh, related that way. And knowing the relationships of these words helps you to understand each of them better. So a sample statement you might find would be something like, she renounced her religion and became an atheist. And of course, atheist is a person who believes in no God. Substantiate. Substantiate the claim with facts. And that is to establish by evidence, to verify, or to support, right? Uh, of course, it comes from the word substance. Substance is any kind of material, something you can see, you can touch, is substance. So it means you are trying to show the substance of evidence in order to support your claim, whatever claim you make. For example, the lawyer in court has to show evidence that a certain person is guilty. He can't just claim that person is guilty. He has to substantiate that claim. And so you might hear a sentence like this, can you substantiate your accusations? Or your teacher might tell you to um, substantiate your claims in your essay. And that means give some quotes or evidence to support your ideas. That's all for this set. Thanks for watching. Please buy the workbook at Amazon.com if you don't have one. Hi, welcome back. This is lesson three of VQ workbook number one. Our first word today is abstemious, abstemious eating habits. And that would mean moderate in eating and drinking, which means you're not eating too much. You're not going to get fat from eating too much. So you might be eating little for different reasons. It might be for religious reasons. Uh, if you're a nun or a monk, you would eat very little. If you want to lose weight, you might be being abstemious in your eating habits uh, because you don't want to eat too much. Or just for good health, you could be eating abstemiously. Austere, austere judge. 
think of a judge like the one in the picture, we usually think of judges as being very strict and stern. So it is their demeanor that seems very strict and always kind of serious. So we could talk about people being strict in demeanor or strict in lifestyle as well. And that means you are being strict in the way you use your money usually. You're not wasting any money. You're saving on everything, skimping and saving as much as you can. Then that would be an austere lifestyle. The noun form of austere is austerity. Curtail. Curtail the program. So the definition of curtail is to shorten or reduce, to bring something to an end. We also used to say curtail the tail because it kind of helped to remember the word. Uh, the idea is that if you had a lizard and if, I don't know if you've heard, if you cut off the tail of a lizard, that the lizard's tail grows back eventually. So you can imagine chopping off the tail of a lizard um, and that's the idea of cutting something short. The idea is to abridge or to shorten something and like the abridge dictionary, but there's a slight difference. When you abridge, the definition was to shorten as to reduce or make it compact or abbreviating, right? Um, but to curtail is to cut short, as in bring something to an end early. Like you had an hour program, but you're running out of time. So you cut it down to 50 minutes or you bring it to an end at 50 minutes. I guess that would be more accurate to say you, we curtail the program after 50 minutes. And that would be the slight difference there. Eclectic, eclectic research. It says from many disparate sources, a lot of kids don't know what disparate means. And it means very different. So you're using sources for your research from very different sources. For instance, well, here having a diverse kind of sources, what we're talking about. Um, as in, uh, you looked up some encyclopedias, but that wasn't it. You looked up some novels, maybe some song lyrics. You did some interviews. Then these are different kinds of sources, and that would be considered an eclectic research. So we can talk about different kinds of things like eclectic taste in music. That means you like all kinds of different music. And you might have an eclectic music collection as a result, right? Or you might uh, talk about the eclectic sources in your bibliography that you write after a report. Fastidious, fastidious dresser. We're talking about a dresser who is difficult to please. So dresser here is nothing special. Dresser is a person who gets dressed. Um, we're talking about the how the person likes to dress. That person is very fussy and is not easily satisfied by anything. So if you bought a gift for this person and you bought a, a piece of clothing, that person is probably not going to like it and more likely to return that item because that person is very fastidious about what she wears. So we can talk about fastidious taste, um, as in fastidious taste in art or taste in music. You might also talk about a very fastidious teacher who doesn't grade very uh, generously. So uh, the teacher likes to scrutinize everything and the teacher is very difficult to please in that manner. Incongruous, incongruous attire. It means not fitting. It is absurd. So anything that seems out of place would be considered incongruous. If, you know, someone is riding a horse through a downtown of a city, that might seem incongruous. Wearing um, uh, Indian tribal attire in the city might seem incongruous. Uh, we also talk about incongruous behavior, as in you're doing something that is not appropriate for that situation. Consider that you are laughing at a funeral. A funeral is a very solemn occasion. And one thing you're not supposed to do is tell jokes and laugh up a storm. That would be incongruous behavior. What if you're wearing a suit to the beach? That would be considered incongruous attire. Magnanimous. Magnanimous priest. A magnanimous priest is generous and great-hearted. 
And that's based on the roots that we need to know. Magna means big and anima means soul or mind. These are important roots, so please write them down and memorize them. Magna, you see often in many words, it means big. Anima is your soul or your mind. So we can say the anima is the heart in this case. And so the magnanimous person has a big heart, a very generous and kind heart. The noun form is magnanimity. Phenomena. Kept records of the phenomena. The definition is observable facts. Anything that you can see that happens is a phenomenon, the singular. The plural of the word is phenomena. So the word that's in your vocab list is phenomena, the plural. Please note that the singular form is spelled differently, phenomenon. The phenomenon can be any kind of strange event, a notable event, like an earthquake or a UFO sighting can be a phenomenon. So we talk about any kind of strange phenomenon or some kind of an unexpected phenomenon. Repel. Insect repellent. What you see in the photo here are some common uh, insect repellent products. You need this when you go camping, right? It is to drive away or disgust. Well, what does that mean? Well, the first one, drive away, comes from uh, the roots here. Re is back or again. And pel is to push. So what you're doing is you're pushing back the insect when you repel the insect. But if you are the person who is offensive, like you are the insect, and what you end up doing is you repel the other people. Other people run away from you because you are disgusting them. You're a disgusting person, and so the other people get pushed back from you. Then you are repelling them, and we call those people repulsive, which is an adjective form of repel. So other pell words are listed here. Um, some examples like propel, a propeller propels the boat, right? It pushes it forward. Expel, you get expelled from school. That means you get pushed out of school or you are impelled to do something. It means you're pushed from the inside, from your moral conscience to do something or compelled to do something means that someone else or usually someone else or some force some motivation makes you want to do something. It's like impel, slightly different. Now, you don't have to learn those words now, but see how they are connected. They are all pell words. Now, there's one more item here. Repulsive behavior, I mentioned, which is uh, using the adjective form of repel, and that's when you are doing something disgusting, you are being repulsive. Subtlety, subtle humor. The definition is perceptiveness or ingenuity or delicacy. When you're being subtle about something, it's sometimes it's about perceptiveness, how you notice things, but usually it's more about how you show something. And in that sense, you are, you are not obvious about it. So a subtle humor is like telling a joke, but it's not very outright funny. So no one's going to, you know, break out laughing about it. It's not that kind of a joke. It's a very subtle humor that somebody has to kind of think about. Maybe it has allusions to some, you know, something historical or some literature that not everyone's going to understand. Then that's a subtle humor. It's not very obvious. So we can talk about subtle smile like the Mona Lisa. When you talk about the Mona Lisa, you, we often hear about the subtle smile she has. It's not like an outright smile or a laugh, but it's very subtle. Somebody might give you a subtle wink, a little bit of a wink that no one else notices is a subtle wink and subtle hint. The noun form is subtle T. Now remember, please, that the B is silent in this word. So it's not subtle, it's subtle, subtle smile and subtlety thanks for watching that was lesson three if you don't have a workbook you can buy it at amazon.com hi welcome to vq book one lesson four
Let's start with the word abstract, abstract noun. The definition of abstract is theoretical or difficult to understand, right? So we talk about an abstract noun in grammar and also as opposed to concrete nouns. Abstract nouns are the nouns for ideas, concepts that we cannot really touch or feel. Um, these are just ideas like love and peace and justice. And they are nouns, but they're not things that are physical. Physical things are called concrete nouns. So words like car, dog, or concrete itself is something that we can touch and see. And these are concrete things. So we also talk about abstract art. And that's what we see in the picture here. It seems like just a lot of colors and lines, but some people see meaning in it. Some see people see something profound in it. And that's called abstract art. There is one other definition, the uh, abstract of a report we hear about, and it means a short summary. So that's a very different definition, but something you might come across later. Well, you might write a, say, a 50 page report on something and add about a paragraph or two at the very beginning uh, as a summary of the whole entire report. And that's called the abstract of a report. Authoritarian, authoritarian government. This means exercising total control or ruling by the authority of whatever the government, the power the government has. Then that dictator is called an authoritarian and the government is called an authoritarian government. So generally, these are the other words that we think of when we think of something like North Korea and their leaders. We call them dictatorships, right? It is a totalitarian government, something you hear about when you read George Orwell's 1984 or Animal Farm. Those are stories of totalitarian governments. Or autocratic is another word. That means something like a dictatorship, an authoritarian government. And, of course, tyranny, ruled by tyrants. And that's another word for a bad dictator. Cynical. A cynical writer. A cynical person is distrustful of human motives, and that person will be called a cynic. That's the person. So the reason we say cynical writer is that traditionally there was this impression that people who write, as in authors of books or political books or journalists for newspapers, they tend to know a lot of things. Uh, about the world and they read a lot and they know a lot, they think a lot. And so they end up learning a lot about all the, you know, the evils of the world and the corrupt politicians and things like that. And they end up not trusting anybody. And that's what a cynical writer is. When they write, they're cynical about the whole world. So we might find a sentence like this. The more he learned about politics, the more cynical he became. All right, so the more you know, the less you trust people. Edify. Edify the church members. And that is to instruct or correct morally. And generally, we're talking about uh, someone like teachers, preachers, or parents. People who are supposed to teach you good morals, how to live your life properly. So to edify the church members, we're thinking of a minister at church who gives sermons on Sunday, and most of those sermons are very practical advice on how you can live better. And he's trying to edify the church members to live more ethically, more morally. The noun for edify is edification. Feasible, feasible plan. A feasible plan is practical, workable, or it's likely in the sense that we are able to do it. So we would ask, is that really a feasible plan? Is that something we can do? Is it realistic? Is it really doable? Is it possible? Can this really happen? And that would be a feasible plan. Inconsequential. Inconsequential to the result which means that it is insignificant and unimportant. Like the spelling error that you might make on a report that you write, if you made an obvious little spelling error, it's probably not going to cost you the grade or anything. So the uh, breakdown of the word 
is in and consequence. In here means not, and consequence is the result, right? So it means it does not affect the consequence, the final result of whatever it is that we're trying to accomplish. Consequential will be the opposite. If some event is consequential, then it is important to the result. But here we're talking about something inconsequential to the result, so it is not important to the result. Malicious. Cinderella's malicious sisters. And that is, of course, the two hateful and spiteful sisters. They're just the archetypal symbols of uh, meanness, cruelness, right? So the breakdown here is mal, which means bad, and that's an important one. Um, so we get words like malevolent, malediction, malefactor. These are other words that uses mal. Um, means bad in each word. If you are malevolent, you are wishing bad on other people. Um, that's the opposite of benevolent. Benevolent is like the magnanimous priest we saw earlier. Benevolent means wishing good on people. Malevolent, wishing bad. Malediction is saying bad in the sense that you're saying a curse to them. Like go to hell is, is a curse in the sense you're cursing them or giving a spell of curse to them. And that's a malediction, opposite of benediction, which is a blessing. Malefactor, as opposed to benefactor. Benefactor does good things. Malefactor does bad things. So mal is a, a root that you'll see often in these other big words. So please uh, commit it to memory. Philanthropist, donation by the philanthropist. And so a philanthropist is the lover of mankind one who gives large donations. And we say lover of mankind because of the roots of the word. Philos means love and anthropos means mankind. And so the word itself says it's a person who loves mankind. Now, if I love the mankind and love everybody, I don't become a philanthropist though. Uh, no one's going to call me a philanthropist. You have to be someone like Bill Gates. You have to have millions and billions of dollars and you have to donate a large sum of money in order to be called a philanthropist. So yes, nowadays it only has to do with money, giving of money. Related word is misanthrope. Mis means to hate, which is the opposite of philo. So a misanthrope is someone who hates mankind. Philosophy has the same root as uh, uh, philanthropist because the philo there is love, and someone who studies philosophy is someone who philo loves sopho, wisdom. So Socrates and Plato were people who loved wisdom. We also have the word Philadelphia, which is the city of brotherly love. Phil for love and Adelpho for uh, brother. And you might hear words like audiophile, where the file comes at the end of the word. That means a lover of. So an audiophile is someone who loves great audio, sounds and music or, you know, sound equipment, things like that. That's an audiophile. If you're an Anglophile, you love England. If you're a Sinophile, you love China and so on. Replete. Replete with books. Replete means you are abundantly filled with something. And of course, replete with books, we're talking about a library. A library is always replete with books by definition. So we might say a sentence like this. The library is replete with books on eclectic subjects, right? We learned that word, eclectic research, a lot of disparate sources. Um, other usage might be uh, someone telling you that your report is replete with errors. Your, your report has too many errors in it. It's full of errors. Or you might read a story and the teacher might explain how the story is replete with ironies. There are lots of ironies filled in, uh, taking up uh, within the story. Succinct. Succinct answer. Succinct answer is very brief, terse, and compact, which means that it's very compact and precise without wasted words. So you're not giving a, you know, 
hundred word answer to a short, you know, simple question. You just say yes, no, maybe, or you just give a very short explanation in minimal words. So dictionaries will give you succinct definitions of words, right? Um, you might say that he gave a succinct presentation, a very short presentation, but very full of meaning. Thanks for watching. The website is vqworkbook.com. Okay, we're going on to lesson five of our workbook. First word is abstruse, abstruse essay. And that means hard to understand and esoteric, which means that it's very hard in the sense that it's difficult material and that's why you can't understand it. So some similar words are obscure, complex, or profound. So it's not just a report that's badly written and so you can't understand it. It really is well written for that particular topic and it is difficult because it is very complex. Autonomous, 50 autonomous states. The 50 autonomous states of the United States are self-governing states with the root uh, auto, which means self, and nomo, which means law and order. These are important roots. Please write them down and memorize them. So auto is things that are, you know, like automatic. It is done with the self. And nomo is about law and order, like in the words like astronomy, economy, taxonomy, physiognomy. These are some other words that you might notice that these are all kind of academic words. It's about the, the law, order, arrangement of things. And so they tend to be the more academic material. The autonomous states are able to govern themselves, control themselves. So as an example, in terms of laws, there are, there are federal laws. The federal government, uh, headed by the Congress and the president, makes certain laws, but each state is able to make their own laws regarding, say, drinking age, driving age, right to, you know, possess a gun um, or carry a gun, things like that. Uh, those are left up to the states, and so the states are considered autonomous in that sense. Another place you might hear about the word autonomous is when we talk about autonomous vehicles. Google and other companies are developing these autonomous vehicles. They are vehicles that drive themselves. They are self-controlling vehicles. The noun form of autonomous is autonomy. Daunt, undaunted by the threat. To daunt is to intimidate someone. So a bully daunts the other child. And so that's the daunt part of it. If you are undaunted, then you are not daunted. You're not made afraid by the bully. We could also talk about a daunting task, which is a job that is very intimidating. It's too big of a job for you to handle. So you get afraid, nervous about it at the beginning. Uh, or a daunting challenge, a challenge that seems very difficult to undertake. Efface, efface the graffiti, and that means to rub out. So graffiti is the writing stuff on the walls, right? And someone has to efface that graffiti. I just noticed this interesting image here. Uh, this is actually a graffiti of someone effacing the graffiti. So the person there is not a real person. That is the graffiti itself. Kind of ironic, right? So we could also talk about coins with dates effaced by where. So imagine a coin, the surface of which has been rubbed off over time through wear, and so you can't really feel the dates or the other images anymore. Then we say that the dates were effaced by wear. You can have a memory that is effaced by time. Certainly as you get old, you lose your memory. It seems like it's getting rubbed out of your memory. You would also hear uh, this expression that uh, someone was using self-effacing humor or he has a self-effacing attitude. And it means that you're being kind of modest and making fun of yourself and putting yourself down for the sake of other people to amuse them, entertain them, or to make others feel better. That is self-effacing. 
fell. Lumberjack felled the tree. And that means to cut or knock down. It is a transitive verb, which means that it takes an object to the sentence. It is different from the, the typical word fall that we think of. Fall, fell, fallen, that's the basic word. The tree falls, but it takes the lumberjack to fell the tree, and then the tree will fall down. So it's a totally different word. And the breakdown is fell, felled, and felled for this word. Incontrovertible. Incontrovertible evidence. And that means indisputable, not open to question, which means that it is an absolutely true, factual, uh, definite kind of evidence that no one can argue against. So we break it down and we have in, which means not, contro, as in opposite, like contradiction, and vert or verse, which is to turn. And that's where we get controversy. Controversy is when people turn a against opposite of each other and they argue about things and that's a controversy but here we don't get a controversy because the evidence is absolutely certain so if someone says oh they had got the evidence of bigfoot bigfoot like uh, what you see here in the picture uh, is this incontrovertible evidence well uh, photos can be manipulated these days and they can be photoshopped or it could be a guy in a suit. We don't know. So this is not really incontrovertible evidence. If we found some DNA of um, some creature that was not human but similar to human, possibly that might be incontrovertible evidence of something. So generally think of some evidence so strong that no one can dispute it. That's the idea. Marred, marred surface of the table. That means the surface has been damaged or disfigured. So the verb to mar is to spoil or destroy it somehow. You can scratch it up, uh, you can paint on it, whatever. You are destroying that surface. That is to mar the surface of something. So if you have a marred reputation, somehow your reputation has been sullied. Somebody has defamed you and or told lies about you or something. You might have your life marred by drug problems, right? So if you have a lot of problems, then your um, life is destroyed somehow, spoiled somehow. Piety. Piety of the nuns. And that is the religious devotion, the godliness. This is being devoted to your God, being good and virtuous, things like that. Those qualities are the piety. The adjective form is pious, uh, so we talk about the pious nuns. And nuns are, by definition, they should be pious because they give up their whole life uh, so that they can live for God in a convent somewhere thinking only about God, and that would be being pious. And that reminds me of this uh, famous thing from uh, philosophy. When you end up talking about Socrates or Plato in class, you will hear about this at some point in your high school or college, I'm sure. Um, there's this story of Euthyphro's dilemma. It is found in Plato's dialogue with Euthyphro in which Socrates asks Euthyphro this question. The question is, is the pious loved by the gods because it is pious or is it pious because it is loved by the gods? Okay, so you got to kind of read it slowly and think about it. It means something like, oh, let's say, you know, we could talk about a person, the pious person. Um, if this nun is pious, we call her pious nun. Is that person loved by the gods because she's a pious person? Or do we call her pious because gods love this particular person? Then we call her pious. Okay, so it's a kind of a philosophical question, but... That's where we use the word piety, pious. Reprehensible, reprehensible actions of the terrorist. Of course, terrorists do terrible things, right? They uh, hurt people and the reprehensible actions are deserving blame, which means it's bad and something that we should criticize. So the verb reprehend which makes up the basis of this word, is to voice disapproval of, to censure, which is publicly criticizing someone. You might say your actions are reprehensible.
superficial, superficial knowledge of grammar. This means trivial or shallow, trivial in the sense that it is not very uh, important, that's trivial. And shallow means it's not very deep and profound, it's just on the surface. And that's what superficial means, on the surface, on the outside. Super is the prefix, which means above and beyond. And faces, uh, that's face here. You don't need to know that one, but memorize the super part. But it is about being on the face, uh, on the outside. So when you talk about the superficial knowledge of grammar, then you know like the basic things like subject and verb and noun, pronoun, a few things, but you don't know any deep, profound, structural things related to grammar then you just have a superficial knowledge of grammar. So we can talk about the superficial qualities of something. Let's say you saw a nice car and you're only concerned about the shape of it, the color of the paint and things like that, what you see on the outside, then that you're only concerned with the superficial qualities. So when a person, you know, if a guy is, you know, likes a girl and he only cares about how that girl looks, her hair, her you know makeup, her clothes, things like that. He's being very superficial. Or if a girl you know looks for a rich guy only, then that would be considered superficial. You can be wasting money on superficial things. And there is one other situation where you hear superficial, and that's when someone says uh, he received superficial injuries. So maybe he was shot, but he did, wasn't hurt seriously because it was only superficial injuries. And you can kind of guess that it was just on the surface injuries, which means the bullet grazed his skin or something, but didn't really um, hit any organs or anything. All right. Thanks for listening. You can get back to your workbook and memorize your phrases. Hi, welcome back. Let's get started with lesson six. Accessible, accessible on foot. Definition is easy to approach, reach, or enter. It just basically means you are able to get access to that place. Access means being able to get there, right? So, for example, we can talk about a physical location like the cliff that you see there. You want to get to the top of it. Is that accessible on foot? Can I walk there somehow um, following a trail? Then it will be accessible on foot. Or some computer data might be accessible or inaccessible. It depends on whether it's locked for you or it's available to you. Aversion. Strong aversion to snakes. That is a firm dislike. And why do we get that? Let's break down the words. So we'll see that we have ab, which is away, and vert and verse to turn. I think we've seen these before. Um, please do make note and try to learn them. Ab is away and vert is to turn. So if you are averse to something, you avert your eyes maybe. You avert yourself. That means to turn away from it. And that is avert the verb. Um, you are averse to it as an adjective, and the noun is aversion. Debilitate, debilitated by old age, and that means weaken or enfeeble, and that is to debilitate. So the person is debilitated, weakened by old age. And it comes from the root word debilis, which is not something you have to memorize, but it means weak, and so it means to make weak. Now, it is not this root, uh, but it looks like it. And this is how it helps me to remember the word. I think of D plus ability. D as in being not and ability. So if you are debilitated, then your ability is taken away. So it's easier to remember it that way. Um, but that is not the correct root in this case. Elaboration. Elaborate on the idea. And that is addition of details. So if you elaborate on something, that means you add more details and you explain more. And the roots here are E and labor. E is for X, which is out. When you see a lone E at the front of a word, it's usually the shortened form of X, which means out. And labor is work here. And so 
Therefore, it means you have to labor more, work more on the explaining. You have to work it out more. Fervor. Fervor of the protesters. Whenever you have protesters, you will have glowing ardor, intensity of feeling. Usually they're very upset and that's why they're protesting, right? So they're out there shouting and screaming and maybe throwing things. There is that kind of intensity of feeling. The ardor means their burning passion. Some examples here. The letter DG means, for example, um, soldiers in battle would have a lot of fervor, right? Or rioters on the streets would definitely show fervor. Or fans at a World Cup game, they show a lot of fervor. Incorrigible, incorrigible habit, a habit that is not correctable and breaks down easily with in and corrig. In is for not, corrig is for correct, and corrig is not a very common root, so you don't have to try to memorize that one, but it helps to understand the word. It means not correctable, right? So, for example, you can talk about an incorrigible liar. That's someone who lies as a habit and um, they're not going to break the habit. So someone who can't be fixed from the habit is an incorrigible liar. Materialism, materialistic society. And that is preoccupation with physical comforts and objects. Preoccupation with materials of the world, right? So it means you are caring about materials more than values. You don't care much about honesty or feelings or, you know, values or anything like that. You care about money, possessions, fancy houses, nice cars, things like that. That If that's all you care about, you are a materialistic person. And we today, uh, unfortunately, we live in, an, a mater in a materialistic society. Pitfall. Pitfalls of life. Hidden danger. And pitfall of life is any kind of danger you encounter in life, but basically it means a hidden hole in the ground. So the image that you see here is, uh, is an Atari game called Pitfall. And this is a game that was very popular back in, say, 1980s or so, in the very early days of video games. And the idea here is that you're that guy in the center that is running across the uh, screen and there are logs coming at you. And in every screen, this is basically, you get a repetition of this very same scene. That black hole in the center is a pitfall. It's a hole in the ground that you can fall into. And so you have to swing on the vine to get across it. And that is the pitfall. And that's hence the name of the game. It's not a pitfall of life, but it's a pitfall in the jungle. Reprove. Reprove the unruly student. To reprove is to yell at a some you know, yell at a kid for doing something wrong, basically. And the words we find in the definition are censure, rebuke, and scold. Uh, I think we use the word scold a lot, right? Um my parents scolded me. And censure and rebuke is pretty much the same thing when someone yells at you. Superfluous. Superfluous details. That means unnecessary, excessive, overabundant. Having too much of something is superfluous. The root here, we have super, meaning above or beyond, and the flu, which is to flow. Those are important. Please memorize them. And so superfluous, therefore, means the details are flowing over. Like you fill the cup too much with liquid, then it's flowing over. Well, you could be writing an essay where you have a lot of details that are unnecessary, a little too much that it went on too long without really arguing anything profound. You just gave lots of superfluous details. Then we will call that unnecessary and superfluous. Thanks for watching. Hi, welcome back. This is lesson seven of our workbook. Let's go on to the first word. Acclaim, acclaim the heroes. That means to applaud or to praise someone. Giving a medal to a soldier would be definitely acclaiming the hero. 
The word acclaim can be a noun or a verb. So as a noun, you might say, he received high acclaim. That means high praise. Or as a verb, critics acclaim the movie. They praise the movie. Banal. Banal essay. Banal essay has the definition of hackneyed, commonplace, and trite. Uh, you might not be familiar with these words, and if you looked any of them up in the dictionary, you'll just see all the other words as the definition. But they have the same idea, which is that it is very typical content, typical information that is nothing new or original. So when you're watching a movie, you might be disappointed by the banal conversations in the movie, or perhaps the banal plot, like you watch an action movie, the plots are usually the similar thing. Or you're watching a music video and everybody's dancing in a very typical, boring way, then you say that is banal choreography. Decorous. Her decorous behavior was praised. That means proper and showing decorum. A common mistake students make is thinking that this word has something to do with decorate. And it is not related to the word decorate. It has nothing to do with it. Instead, it is from the word decorum, which means having proper manners, being very gentlemanlike or very ladylike. That is the noun decorum. And the adjective from it is decorous. Elated. Elated child at Disneyland. Elated child is overjoyed. Simply means he is very happy and excited, like any child at Disneyland should be. Fitful, several fitful attempts. That means spasmodic, intermittent, on and off. And that's what intermittent and spasmodic means. It means you're doing something on and off, it's not continuous. So not doing it consistently is what we're talking about, like going on a diet. You do it a little bit and then you give up and then you come back and try it again and you keep failing, but you try it on, on and off, on again, and that would be fitful attempts. Like trying to learn a language on your own. You pick up a book and you read it for a few days and then you give up, come back to it a few months later, you've forgotten everything. Those are fitful attempts. And that's the same thing with studying vocabulary. If you study just a few words here and there and then you give up and not look at it for several months, chances are you're just going to... Uh, it, forget everything that you learned. And so it's just not a good idea to study in such fitful manner. We could also talk about things happening on and off kind of manner, like a fitful night sleep. That means you are sleeping and you can't fall asleep during the night. So you sleep on and off. You keep waking up. Indefatigable. Indefatigable marathon runner. And that is a runner that is tireless. If we break down the word, we get in for not, D for down. And then we have the word fatigue, which means being tired, tiredness, and then able. So if you put it together, it means you're not able to get down to a fatigue level. You're not getting tired. So an indefatigable marathon runner, think of a runner who is running many, many kilometers. I don't know how many that is. Uh many miles and the person is not getting tired at all just seems to be you know fully energized throughout the whole race then that's an indefatigable marathon runner meager meager earnings that is scanty and inadequate which just means not enough money and usually we're referring to very small amounts of money like a meager salary or meager wages so anybody who works for very little money is getting meager earnings. Also, we could be talking about something like meager diet. And that means eating very little because they're poor, there's not enough food, then they have to subsist on meager diet. You might even talk about meager light in the room. That means very little light. Maybe one light bulb for, the, for a large room would be meager light in the room. Pithy, pithy remark, and that means concise and meaningful, and it's actually the two parts together. It has to be concise and meaningful, really, uh, a short statement, but full of meaning. So in Twitter, you're allowed to write only 140 characters. I think that's the number, 
And so if you want to send out a, you know, profound message, it's very difficult. You have to make it very pithy. So you would make a pithy Twitter comment. Repudiate. Repudiate all debts. And that means to disown or disavow. And let me point out that on the word debt, you should not be pronouncing the B. That's a silent B. So not debt. It is a debt. So it is to say that it doesn't belong to you. So imagine that you get a credit card bill and the bill says that you spent $3,000 in Europe for, you know, buying the televisions or something. And um, you look at it and you don't understand why that was charged to you. It was probably, you know, your account being stolen and misused. So you call up the credit company and you have to disown those charges say that it's not yours or disavow them. Or in this case, our word is to repudiate the charges, repudiate the debts. <laughs> Surpass, surpassed his rival. And that is to exceed or to pass up. And we could be thinking about someone like, um, like racers, you know, one, pa one person passing up the other person. But more often it's not so physical, it's about the performance or quality. So it is to become better in some way. And we might have a sentence like, like this, Samsung phones have surpassed iPhones in quality or in sales or, you know, something like that. And that means it implies that Samsung was probably behind for a while, but now has caught up and it has passed up uh, the iPhones, the Apple. So it is the, the quality of, you know, being better than the other or becoming better than the other. Thanks for watching. If you don't have the workbook, please buy one at Amazon.com. Hi, we're back and we're going on to lesson eight of our VQ workbook. First word is acknowledge. Acknowledge the truth. And that means to admit to be real or true. So usually you're giving some sign that you understand or that you admit something. As in a statement like this, he would not even acknowledge my presence. As in, it could be a situation where you made somebody angry. It could be a friend. And so you walk into a room and your friend uh, is mad at you. So the person just pretends you're not even there. Then the person is acknowledge not acknowledging your presence. That's apparently what's happening here with this uh, image. Um, the person is crying. Why won't you acknowledge me? I'm not really sure what that person is hanging on to. Some kind of bin, uh, maybe waiting for mail or something. Uh, to acknowledge, I usually want other people to acknowledge that you're there. Acknowledge your existence. If they ignore you, that's a very hurtful feeling. You could also say that he acknowledged that I was right. I objected to what he said, and he um, admitted that I was right and he was wrong, and that he's acknowledging it. Or he might it might be as simple as him nodding at what I said, then he's acknowledging that I was right, or he agrees to a certain extent. Barren, barren desert. Barren means desolate, fruitless, and unproductive. Just basically means that nothing is able to grow there. And of course, we're usually referring to land. So deserts are barren lands. And sometimes we're referring to a woman who cannot bear children. So if the woman has some sort of a medical problem that prevents her from having children, she's considered a barren woman, then uh, she might consider adoption as an option. Defame. Defamed my character. To defame is to harm someone's reputation. If we break it down, we get D and fame, right? D is down or away, or sometimes it could be not or the opposite, the negative. And here, that's what we have. We have the negative of fame. So to uh, make someone's fame go down. And that could be by you telling the truth or lie, but it kind of implies that you're lying and just trying to make the person look bad. That's defaming my character. And so in the image here, we have the banner that says, don't defame India. Apparently they're mad about somebody who made a comment that made the Indians look bad and they don't want to be defamed that way. 
Elegy, Elegy for the Dead. Elegy is a poem or song of lamentation. And to lament means that you're crying about something. So we're talking about any kind of sad song. It is often about someone dead, although it doesn't have to be. So when you look at a CD cover that looks like the image you have there, uh, the word elegy right away tells you this CD is going to be just a lot of sad music. And so um, the expression on the artist's face kind of goes along with that idea, right? Flagrant. Flagrant violation of the rules. Flagrant means very blatant and obvious. It's not fooling anyone. It's just very open, very obviously bad act is a flagrant violation. So if you're cheating in class, and if everybody's cheating in class, that would be flagrant cheating in class that the teacher sees. Or if you outright outright make up a lie um, that is very obvious, then that's a flagrant lie. Indelible, indelible ink, an ink that is not able to be erased. So we have in for not and delete basically, and then able. So something ink that is not deletable is an indelible ink. So we can talk about indel indelible doodles, some kind of doodle that you do on paper, or maybe you do it on a wall and get your parents upset because it is indelible. Or we can talk about indelible memory, some event from the past that will not be erased from your memory. It is indelible. Meander, meander through the park. The definition is wind or turn in its course, not wind or turn. Okay, this is to, to be winding. That means kind of going in, in a kind of twisting path. So the verb uh, meander can mean to follow a winding course, as in the shape of the road can be meandering, that the shape itself is in these curved kind of forms. So we would have a sentence like the path meandered through the woods. Or we could say, that a person meanders. That means the person walks in this manner, not, not in a hurry, not going towards a goal or anything, but just kind of wandering aimlessly. He meandered through the woods, you would say. Placate. Placate the angry customer. That is to pacify, conciliate, or make calm. If you are a an employee or usually the manager is responsible for this. A manager at any business, McDonald's or Walmart or wherever, uh, their role is to placate any angry customer, no matter what the reason is. That's the first thing they have to do. And so the root here is plaque. Plaque means to please. So if you speak Spanish or you learn the Spanish, you might recognize placer, which is to to please someone or the noun for pleasure. And so it is related to the word placid as in a placid lake. It has the same root. It means kind of pleasing, calm and peaceful kind of thing. So a related word is implacable or implacable. Either pronunciation is fine. You can kind of tell by the makeup of the word that means im, not and plac, able. You are not able to placate that person. Then your enemy is an implacable enemy. Rescind. Rescind the contract. That means to cancel or nullify a contract, to make it null and void. So this usually happens when a judge looks at a contract because of some lawsuit and he finds that um, it is just a really bad contract. There are terms in there that's not really legal for you to make. Like if one man said, oh, if I don't pay back the money, I will cut off my left arm. Well, you can't make contracts like that. So the judge would just rescind the contract and it would be as if the contract didn't exist in the first place because he is canceling the contract. It could mean also a situation like a general rescinding his order and that means he gave an order and he canceled it. Surreptitious. Surreptitious peak. That is secret, furtive, sneaky, or hidden. 
So being like a thief, you are um, looking at something. And of course, we're uh, thinking of cheating in school where you just kind of take a surreptitious peek at your neighbor's test paper. Then you're being very secretive. Thanks for watching. That was lesson eight. Let's get back to the workbook and answer those questions. Hi, welcome back. This is VQ Workbook Lesson 9. Let's get started. Acquiesce. Acquiesce to the demand. That means to submit or comply silently or without protest. That means you are saying okay reluctantly. When your teacher demands a lot of homework from you, what can you do? There's not much you can do except to acquiesce to the demand. Beguile. Beguiled by the devil, and that is being misled or de being deluded. So the definition to beguile is to mislead or to delude. And we are beguiled by the devil from the word guile, which means deception or trickery. So when we are beguiled, we are tricked and deceived by the devil. Deference. Show deference to elders. Basically, Kids should respect the elders and what? Show respectful submission to the opinions of others. So we're basically saying, hey, you're older, so I'll say you're right. I won't argue with you just to show you respect. That is showing deference to elders. Elicit. Elicit answers from students. That means to draw out by discussion. That is to... For a teacher to ask questions to draw out opinions or feelings from the students and let them express their feelings or express whatever opinions they have. And so we might also get a sentence like this. His insensitive remarks elicited anger. That means he drew out anger from the audience or the listeners because he made some insensitive remarks. And so he is causing that to happen. Florid, florid complexion, that is ruddy, reddish, or flowery. So complexion, we're talking about the color of skin, usually on the face. And it could also refer to very flowery style, as in style of writing or drawing or things like that. So if you have a very florid writing style, it's very flowery in the sense that it's very descriptive and creative and things like that. Here in the photo, the child has very florid complexion on his face. Indict. Indict the suspect. And that means to charge formally for a crime. Uh, please note the pronunciation. It is indict. The C is silent in this word. So for a criminal, this is the normal process. He would, if he is suspected of some kind of crime, he will be arrested first. And then he will be put in jail. And while he's in jail, and I think uh, in the first 48 hours or so, um, the lawyers, the prosecutors will see if there's enough evidence against them. And then they will do the indictment, which is charging him formally with the crime. Uh, they could hold him for a certain period of time before they actually charge him. But they have to do this indictment. And then he will be sent to trial later and then the jury will come back with the verdict and then he will get the sentencing which is how much of jail time or prison time he would get mercenary selfish and mercenary if you are mercenary you're interest interested in money or gain or like personal gain originally the word mercenary referred to soldiers who fight for money so you might have heard of, uh, say, the, the Hessians in, the, in history class. The Hessians were famous hundreds of years ago as soldiers who fought for any country that paid them enough money. Um, and so the poster I have here is for the A-Team. This is uh, recently a movie. This is the movie poster. Very popular TV show back in the uh, 80s. Uh, about a group of people who were who are ex-soldiers and now working as mercenaries. So they would go on special projects for money, basically. So they don't belong to any country. 
Now, if we say something like selfish and mercenary or mercenary motives, we're talking about anyone who cares more about the money, cares about the money first and nothing else really. That is the selfish and mercenary attitude. Ponderous, ponderous lecture, ponderous burden. That is very weighty and unwieldy. It means it's very heavy, right? So ponderous lecture is very heavy and dull and boring lecture. I'm sure most lectures you'll get in high school or college are going to be very ponderous lectures. Or ponderous burden is a very heavy load you have to carry. Now in the case of the elephant, you can talk about how his movements are very ponderous, ponderous movements. That's very slow, heavy, and unwieldy. Reserve. Judges air of reserve. And that is being self-controlled. If you show reserve, then you have self-control. So the air used in this phrase means the demeanor or the appearance of the judge. Usually we think of judges being very calm and serious all the time. So we would talk about the judge's air of reserve, the seriousness or the calmness associated with his demeanor. Susceptible, susceptible to colds, impressionable or easily influenced. We would often say that children are more susceptible to colds than adults or to any other disease. They are more likely to be affected because their immune systems are, are weaker than adults' immune systems. Thanks for watching. Get the workbook if you don't have one. Hi, welcome back. This is lesson 10 of our VQ workbook. Number one, acquire, acquire wealth. And that is to gain for oneself. And so it is a synonym to ideas like get, buy, steal, receive. Whenever you get something, you can use the word acquire. So instead of get, you should get in the habit of using acquire whenever you can. Instead of saying he got some money, try, try saying he acquired some money. So instead of saying he got a degree from Harvard, say he acquired a degree from Harvard. Belie. His size belies his strength. The idea is to contradict or give false impression. So here we're talking about, say, a very big person but very weak or a very small person who is very strong. So the size of that person that you see actually lies about the real strength, and that is his size belying his strength. Degrade. Movies degrade the minorities. That is to lower in rank or debase. As in debase, here we have the prefix D, which means down or away, and then you have grade. So downgrade something. And often we talk about how movies degrade the minorities. And this is maybe not so much anymore, but, you know, just a few decades ago, whenever you saw, you know, Hispanics or Asians or blacks in movies, you would often find that they're kind of caricatures. They're in there for comic effects. And so we, a lot of people would say that movies degrade the minorities in those movies. We would also talk about certain images like magazine covers or billboards and claim that the images are degrading to women. In a different sense, we can talk about some kind of a breakdown as a kind of a downgrading of something. The bacteria will degrade the hydrocarbons. Or you might say that your video quality will be degraded. It will be downgraded when you watch on a bad TV or something. Eloquence. Eloquence of the speaker. That is expressiveness or being able to speak very fluently. E is equal to X, right? That E at the front of a word is usually X, meaning out. And then the root loqua. Loqua is a very common one. You should take note and uh, memorize that. And that is to speak. So therefore, this is speaking out very well. 
generally we're talking about someone who speaks very impressively. So um, presidents are usually very eloquent, of course, or anybody on the news. Uh, broadcasters are very eloquent. Foolhardy. Don't be foolhardy. That means rash or bold. And this is just like the word audacious that we have seen earlier. It is being foolishly adventurous, doing things that are just very dangerous and you're doing it like a fool in a way. So we can have a foolhardy explorer who goes on adventures that are very dangerous or a foolhardy investor might be someone who takes all his money and invests it in one stock, which is not a good idea. Indifferent. Feel indifferent toward the poor. You are unmoved or unconcerned by the poor. So you are basically not feeling differently about different things. You don't care about rich people or poor people. You just don't care either way. No difference in feeling about anything. Then you feel indifferent. So it's your, basically your I don't care attitude. Methodical. Methodical approach to the problem. And that is being systematic in the sense that you are using methods in solving a problem. So when you learned your algebra, I'm sure the teacher made you write the problems one line at a time over multiple lines, rewriting everything with small changes, right? That is a very methodical approach to solving the problem. Pragmatic, pragmatic considerations. These are practical and useful considerations, things relating to the real world. So not just in theory, but in relation to the world and how we could actually use those ideas. So we might consider a history teacher who tells you about plumbing and that teacher has a lot of knowledge of Roman aqueducts, but that's just all in theory and history. A plumber, however, if you ever you know, need your toilet fixed or pipes fixed, you, you don't call your history teacher. You need to call your plumber because he has pragmatic knowledge, practical knowledge. We can also talk about a pragmatic view of public education. That would be an example of how you would use the word. A pragmatic view is not an idealistic conceptual view, but practically what is it that we can do in public education? How many hours? How many teachers? The real world concerns. That would be a pragmatic view. Resigned. Resigned to die. That is accepting one's fate. So if you resign from a job, that means to quit the job. And we're probably all familiar with that idea. Um, but we also need to know this idea of being resigned to die. So that is like quitting your job, but you're quitting on your life or quitting on whatever it is uh, the situation calls for. If you are resigned, you pretty much given up and you're not trying anymore. Sustain. Sustain an injury or sustain life. That is experience, support, nourish, a lot of different words. It's hard to really conceptualize what that is uh, unless you think about the situation with the phrases, the real context. So let's think about these contexts. These are two very different definitions. Uh, number one is sustain an injury. That means you received an injury. We hear this often. We say something like several soldiers sustained injuries in the attack or he sustained some injuries in the car accident. The other one, sustain life, is very different. It means to keep life going by doing something in some manner. We need food and shelter to sustain life, to keep life going. Thanks for watching. That was lesson 10. Now you can go back to your workbook and answer your questions. Hi, welcome back to VQ Book 1. We're on lesson 11. Our first word is adroit, adroit handling of the ball. The definition is nimble in use of hand or body, and that means you are using your hand very well. 
uh, as in someone like a basketball player who can spin the ball on their finger. Uh, that's being very adroit. And it comes from the root word droit in French. Probably it's pronounced something like droit, uh, but that's French. I don't speak French, so we'll just call it droit. Droit uh, having to do with your right hand or being straight. So linguistically speaking, anything with the right hand, anything associated with the right hand is good. Anything associated with the left hand is bad traditionally. So a word like sinister comes from Latin sinister, which is the left hand. And now we know sinister things are evil. So uh, there are a lot of words like that. We'll see them and talk about them later as we come across them. So usually we're talking about something often relating to hand skills uh, because it is about the right hand. So you get you're very adroit in doing things with your hands. But sometimes it is also related to cleverness on how you do things or how you think about things. So we can talk about an adroit leader, and that would mean he is able to think of things very cleverly, has good ideas. Or we might talk about adroit maneuvers, and that could be a maneuver of moving personally, like um, a football player running through the enemy line could be very adroit in how he maneuvers through, or a military unit going through the enemies he could be uh, making some very clever adroit maneuvers. Benevolent, the benevolent priest. And that means generous and charitable. If we break down the word, it's very easy to see that we have bene for good and volo for wish. And the opposite would be mal, uh, where mal means bad, and that would make some antonyms. But let's think about the word benevolent. If you are good wishing, it means that you care about other people and you wish good things happen to other people. So generally, we think of someone like a priest uh, as being benevolent, being kind and caring all the time. So that's the phrase, the benevolent priest. Think of a very generous person, caring person. So benevolent is our word for wishing good on others. And what would be the opposite? What if you wish bad on other people? That would use the prefix mal, and you would get malevolent. So benevolent and malevolent are opposite words. Similarly, we can talk about benediction and malediction. Benediction is a blessing, and malediction is a curse. And one more set, we can talk about beneficent and maleficent. Maleficent was a title of a movie, um, a Disney movie, I think, about... Um, about the witch, I forget. Angelina Jolie played the uh, the evil witch in a Snow White story. Cinderella, not Cinderella. I think it was Snow White or something. So anyway, that's the title there. It means you are uh, maleficent. Means you're doing bad, doing harm to others. Beneficent means you're doing good for others. Delineate. Delineate the riot in pictures. To delineate is to portray, to show as an image. It means basically draw a picture of, a, of something. And a riot, of course, is when a lot of people are on the streets, um, you know, going wild, protesting and stuff. Um, and imagine somebody drawing that in pictures. So the breakdown of the word is D for down. Please memorize that. And then you have the word line built into the word and eight. When you see eight suffix at the end of a word, it means to make, to make it that way. So to delineate, therefore, means to put something down as lines of a picture on a piece of paper. That's delineating something. So it could be actual drawings or it could be just verbal descriptions of something. You could delineate a scene by telling people about it. So in a book, you might say that the author delineates the character in detail in chapter one. Elucidate, elucidate the theory. 
To elucidate means to explain or to enlighten, which means to give information, to teach, right? Um, the breakdown is you have an E at the front, which means X when it comes in front of a root word. And so that is out. And then you get the word lucid, which is an English word that means clear. And then you have eight again, which is to make, to make it clear, and clear out, out isn't going to be interpreted exactly, but it means to draw it out and make it clear for everybody to see. And that is to elucidate. Um, so therefore it is to make an idea clear. Okay. In usage, you would say that he elucidated the theory, the thing that you're trying to clear up the idea, but you would not say he elucidated the students about the theory that would, um, that would be incorrect usage. You can enlighten the children, the students about something but you would elucidate the theory, not the students. Frivolous. Frivolous point, frivolous lawsuit. Something frivolous is lacking in seriousness in the sense that it's so unimportant, nobody should pay attention to whatever that person is saying. So a frivolous point is when someone says something that's kind of nonsensical, uh, it seems very trivial. Suppose uh, the teacher tells the student to do, write a report about Shakespeare or, you know, an author of his choice. And he says, for example here, I don't want to write about Shakespeare because his name is too long. Okay, maybe he just doesn't want to type out Shakespeare so many times in his report. But that is really hardly not a, that's hardly a good reason to refuse to do a particular topic. Uh, the name of the um, the author. So that would be a frivolous point or a frivolous objection to the assignment. When we talk about frivolous lawsuit in United States, it's gotten so uh, litigious that a lot of people sue for things that seem very trivial and that we call those things frivolous lawsuit. For example, Someone says, hey, I'm going to sue you for stepping on my foot. Okay, that's not something that's important enough to go to court for and take up court's time. So that would be considered a frivolous lawsuit. And the judge may just throw out the case altogether for wasting the court's time. Indigenous, the indigenous people. Of course, the indigenous people are the native people, people that were the original inhabitants of an area, right? So in North America, we have the American Indians, which we used to call American Indians, but now the proper term is Native Americans, as we call them. Uh, if you go to Australia, you have the natives, the indigenous people there, and those people are called the Australian Aborigines. It's a special term for them. If you went to New Zealand, the uh, indigenous people would be called the Maori people. Meticulous, meticulous housekeeper. Yeah, that's a housekeeper who is excessively careful, painstaking and scrupulous uh, in the sense that she takes care of everything and dusts every corner, even maybe under the tables. She leaves nothing untouched. So being very perfect and precise in every detail that is meticulous, very thorough and attentive. Prattle, baby prattled on. And that means to babble. And that's the kind of noises that babies make all the time because they can't speak and formulate words yet. They're going to be making meaningless sounds, right? You can also use the word to talk about people who do, do speak, uh, who chatter on and on, like teenagers talking on the phone all night long. They prattled on through the night, you might say. Resolution. New Year's resolution. That is a determination, as in you're making a promise to yourself um, to do something. So every new year, people make a resolution that this year I'm going to do something. So there are different forms of this word that we can look at. Resolve 
as in the verb form, and you would say something like, he resolved never to lie again. And that's just him telling himself that he's not going to do it again. He's promising himself not to do it again. That's his determination. Resolved would be used as an adjective and in sentence like, he was resolved in his decision. He was very firm and very determined so that no one could sway him. Then that is being resolved about his decision. Or the resolution, like the New Year's resolution, you would say, hey, my New Year's resolution is to master all VQ words. Sycophant. I'm sick of sycophants. The word is not pronounced psychophants, although that's what it looks like. It is sycophants. So the sick of sycophants is there to help you remember the pronunciation. Sick of sycophant. Definition is servile flatterer. Yes, man. And that's a person who is always trying to kiss up to you and trying to please you because they want to be your friend. For example, if you're the most popular person in school, then a lot of the other students would want to be sycophantic towards you to please you so that they could hang around with you to become popular. And you might say, hey, I'm sick of these sycophants always coming around trying to be my friend. If we look at the etymology of the word, it's kind of interesting. You do not have to memorize these roots. Just the story is interesting. Uh, Sycon, fig, Greek, I think, and phanane, to show. So it has something to do with one who shows figs. Okay, so showing of figs. And what could that mean? It turns out there are some different uh, stories regarding it. I'll tell you a couple uh, various theories. One is, it's a person who makes an obscene hand gesture, which is or was called a fig. So, you know, it's like holding up your um, middle finger for our modern times. But in the old days, I guess they had a, a different gesture with the hand. And that person was um, fig shower, basically, and that would be sycophant. But I don't really like that theory because that doesn't seem to be too related to kissing up to anybody. That just seems like insulting. So there's a long-winded kind of explanation that gets to the definition. Uh, the one I think is closer is the second one, which is about a fig orchard. And there's an overseer of the orchard who picks out the best figs. And when the guards come through, um, the guards want to see, you know, if everybody's working well. And the overseer would give him the, give him or show him the best figs and offer it as a gift, uh, kind of a bribe, and try to, you know, kiss up to the guards. And that kind of makes sense with the, the definition of sycophants. So if you remember that story, it might help you to, uh, grasp the idea. Thanks for watching. We'll come back on lesson 12 next time. Hi, welcome back. This is lesson 12 of the VQ workbook number one. The first word is adulation. Adulation of the fans means flattery and admiration. And that means excessive or slavish admiration that you would get from fans of a celebrity. And this is the kind of fawning that they do to the, to the celebrity, uh, kind of worshiping them as if they're some kind of a god. That would be adulating. This is the verb. The verb is to adulate. They are being adulatory, adjective. And if you wanted the person, you would call that person an adulator. Benign, benign sun, benign tumor. Benign can mean kindly or favorable, so something nice and gentle and kind. Or it could mean harmless, which is a different definition. It means it's not great, but it's not harmful, so it's just kind of neutral. So when we talk about the benign sun, we're talking about kind, gentle, warm sun, uh, that you feel on a spring day that might be described as a benign sun. So you can talk about a benign teacher, and that would mean a gentle and kind teacher. But when we talk about a benign tumor, we're talking about a benign tumor versus a malignant tumor. 
a tumor is a growth, that growth of cells that happens in your body. If your doctor detects a tumor growing, then the doctor will order a biopsy. A biopsy is cutting out some of the cells from your body and then having it examined. And if it turns out that it's cancerous, then we call that a malignant tumor. But if it's just a growth that's not going to continue growing and it is not cancerous, we call that a benign tumor. Denounce. Denounce the crime. To denounce is to condemn or criticize. So openly saying that something is bad, someone has done something wrong. D, of course, we have seen many times. That means down or away. Please memorize that. And the nouns part, you don't have to memorize, but it occurs a lot. So you should know the nouns part is to report. So we can compare that with some other words. And we've, did, we've seen this before. Uh, the words renounce, renounce her religion. That was one of our phrases we already covered. Or to announce something or to pronounce your words or to make a pronouncement or... And you know, that's like an announcement too. And these words are all related in the sense that uh, they are reporting something. The letter CF there is shorthand for confer, Latin word confer, which means to compare. So whenever we're going to compare with something else, we'll write the initial CF. Elusive, elusive quarterback. An elusive quarterback is evasive. Or it's an idea that is baffling. So the idea of the elusive quarterback is a quarterback in a football game who runs away from the opposing players. Uh, the goal of the opposing players is to run after the ball, and the quarterback is the one who has the ball. And so the quarterback is always running away from them. And some quarterbacks are very good at that. They are very elusive, and that means... It's very difficult for the other team to catch the quarterback. And so that is physically being hard to catch someone. But when it comes to ideas, we talk about ideas that are hard to grasp. So these are hard to grasp concepts and they would be elusive ideas, elusive theories or elusive um, formulas, things like that. Those are ideas that are hard to understand, hard to catch. Frugality, the frugal gourmet. Frugality is the noun, which means thrift and economy, and which simply means you're saving money. So the word frugal is more often used, I think, the adjective form. It's the same word. So, you know, don't pretend that you saw frugality and you don't recognize frugal because it's the same words, just different forms of the word. So you should be able to recognize those. Um, the phrase, the frugal gourmet, the word gourmet here means a connoisseur of food and drink, which means someone who is an expert of fine food and loves to dine out, loves to enjoy expensive fine uh, food or fine wine, things like that. That's a gourmet. So the Frugal Gourmet was a TV show, a cooking show back in 1980s or so. Um, and this is the gentleman in the picture. He was the Frugal Gourmet. The show was called the Frugal Gourmet. And the idea was that he was a chef who makes very expensive and gourmet dishes with very little money. So he was going to teach the audience how to make gourmet food, but uh, while being very frugal at the same time. So you don't need a lot of money to make expensive food. So you need to have that concept, the idea of this TV show and this gentleman in your mind whenever you say frugal gourmet. Otherwise, the word is not just, it's not going to make much sense to you. Indiscriminate. You should read indiscriminately. Indiscriminate means you're choosing things at random in a kind of confused way sometimes. It does come from the word discriminate. And, you know, we've come to a stage where whenever we hear the word discriminate, we only think of racism and bad things. 
but that's not really the only definition of the word discriminate. Discriminating means that you are distinguishing and separating good things from bad things. For example, you can have a discriminating taste in art, which means that you know how to tell the difference between good art versus bad art. So that's discriminating in a good way. Now, when it comes to books, you can discriminate and say, well, I only want to read romances or I only want to read science fiction. Then you're discriminating. But as young students, we recommend that you read indiscriminately. You should read fiction, nonfiction, just grab a random book from the library sometimes and read indiscriminately. Misanthrope, evil misanthrope. Misanthrope is a person, it's a person who hates mankind. And it's easy to see from the roots how that's built because we have mis, which means hate, and anthropos, which means mankind. These two roots are very important. Please do write them down and memorize them. Mis is to hate. Anthropos, mankind, they are used in many other words. The opposite of a misanthrope is a philanthropist. And I think we have seen this word, donation by the philanthropist, right? Phil for love, anthrope for mankind, someone who loves mankind, so therefore donates a lot of money. The opposite is the misanthrope. Misanthrope hates mankind and wants to destroy the world. Precarious. Precarious investment. That is uncertain and risky. So an investment is when you take your money and you put it, you know, buy some stocks in a company or you put it in the bank or something, and you try to make more money from it. And that's an investment. Uh, sometimes you invest in things. You hear about these things of some people investing all their money in certain company, and that company went bankrupt. So the people who invested in it lost all their money. So some investments are very safe. If you put money into Amazon or Apple or Samsung, these companies are very stable and so the stock prices are likely to rise but slowly. But if you want something more risky, the payoff is better. So you might um, invest in some small venture company in the Philippines or something where the stock is only a dollar a share and you hope that it's going to go up to three, four, five dollars a share. Then you are making multiples of your money. That kind of investment can be considered very uncertain, very risky, very precarious. So one example of that is Bitcoin investment. You might have heard of Bitcoin has gone from few cents per coin many years ago, maybe 10 years ago, to uh, tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, I think it's about, I don't know, it's like um, it's gone over $10,000 per, per coin. I think it's at this time, it's maybe six, seven thousand or so. So it was a big talk of all the people uh, trying to invest, but it was still a precarious investment. And we don't know what's going to happen with that. I, I certainly don't at this point. Um, and so we, we just have to um, take the risk or stay away from these kinds of precarious investment. Also, we talk about things like precarious balance. That's when you have something in a very uh, uncertain kind of balance, physically speaking. And that's what the picture is here. This, the witch, the witch girl is balancing on her broom. And that's a very precarious balance. She might fall off at any minute. So if you take a glass of water and you put it at the edge of a table, your mom can, you know, might get a little nervous that, you know, it's at a very precarious position and you might knock it over. Um, it's likely to happen. It seems very uncertain and risky. Resolve. A firm resolve. Your resolve is your determination to do something. The feeling that you have that you have to do something, that sureness is your determination. So do you have a firm resolve in learning these words, I might ask you. Then you will study very hard. So it is similar to resolution, as in the New Year's resolution that we saw, that is your determination to do something. So we might see a sentence like this. He was 
unwavering in his resolve to become an astronaut. So here we're using the noun form of resolve, as in his resolve. Um, of course, resolution is from the verb resolve. I resolved to do something, so I made a resolution. But they're basically all the same. Taciturn. Taciturn cowboy. The definition is habitually silent and talking little. So why is it a cowboy? Well, it's because of this image that you see in the picture here. Back in the days, right now, these days, uh, advertising for cigarettes and alcohol are very limited. But in back in the days, we saw a lot of these um, billboard advertisements and magazine, full-page magazine advertisements of this Marlboro man all over the place. And that was he was kind of the main figure for the Marlboro advertisement. He was a cowboy standing in all different sorts of positions in, in the kind of uh, out west kind of scenery. And he's never with other people. He's always alone, smoking with a horse maybe, or just kind of leaning against the wall or something, never talking anything. He just seems to be just kind of grinning and looking out into the sun. And that's the kind of image of the taciturn cowboy that we're talking about here. He's habitually silent. So even if you went up and said something to him, he probably wouldn't say more than two words to you. That's being taciturn. The root here is tactic. Uh, it means silent. And we see this uh, root in the word reticent. I think we covered reticence of the suspect. If we haven't, then we will see it later. I can't remember which words we already did and didn't. But reticence is about that. It's about being um, not speaking, being very silent because the suspect is caught by the police. And in those situations, suspects don't like to say anything. So they stay reticent. It has T-I-C, just like the T-A-C here. It means not talking. Thanks for watching. That was lesson 12. I'll see you back at lesson 13 video. Hi, welcome back to VQ Book 1. We are on lesson 13. Adversary. Defeat the adversary. Your adversary is your opponent, your enemy, or your foe. Anybody that you are fighting against or playing a game against, anybody who rivals you is your adversary. Ad here is the prefix meaning to or toward, and vert and verse is to turn. So adverse means something is turned towards you, and so we have an adversary, the person who is facing you and turned towards you, any opponent. So we can compare words like adverse. Uh, adverse is something that is facing you, so it is against you. Or if you are averse to something, we talked about strong aversion to snakes. I'm not sure if we did that yet. And that root there is also vert. That means to turn away. Bequeath. Bequeath the family fortune. To bequeath is to leave your fortune, all your money, through a will. A document, a legal document that says someone is going to receive all the money. So this is the case of a, a rich grandfather, a rich great uncle dying and leaving his money for his grandchildren, his nephews or someone. And that's leaving to someone by a will. And that's called bequeathing the money. And so we might say a ring was bequeathed, a ring bequeathed to her by her grandmother. It could be a thing like a ring. Or we can say, he bequeathed his painting to the museum. He gave it through a will. All right, so we have a strange picture here, image here. Uh, this is what I think of when we uh, say bequeath the family fortune. This is an episode of Twilight Zone, a very famous TV series back from, I don't know, like 1950s or so, when uh, it was only black and white back then. Uh, so very long ago, but still very famous. A lot of people know the Twilight Zone. If you haven't seen any, you might look some up and, and watch some of it. In this particular episode, which I saw as a child in reruns, uh, still, you know, left a big impression on me. 
Uh, it was about these family members who came to a, a dying old man's home on his deathbed, and they were uh, being sycophantic, kissing up to him in order to get uh, a big portion of the money that he was going to bequeath. And so he told them, if you want any of my money, you wear these masks until I die. And so they all put on these grotesque masks. And after the old man finally died, uh, they took off their mask. And it turned out that their face itself had distorted into the shape of the mask. So their faces were all twisted and turned into this grotesque image. It was kind of the old man's uh, revenge against his his very selfish and mercenary uh, relatives who only wanted his money. So that's the situation of bequeathing the family fortune. Deplore. I deplore laziness. It's a way of just expressing that you don't like something. So this is something that a teacher might say. A teacher says, uh, I really deplore the laziness in your in your children. And that means the teacher disapproves of it, thinks it's a bad thing. And this word became kind of um, more popular in common usage because uh, presidential candidate Clinton used it during the election campaign. And she called half of the Trump supporters the deplorables, people who are not likable and kind of disgusting is what she meant except that the, uh, the deplorables, Trump supporters, kind of embraced this term and they started saying, well, I am a deplorable and I love being one of the deplorables. Emaciated. Emaciated children in Africa. When you think of Africa and children, uh, I don't know if you have the same impression, but I always grew up watching these children, starving children, and late night commercials about how I should donate money to save these children. And we still get a lot of that um, when you watch TV uh, late at night. They'll have those commercials and they show images of very thin, bony kids with bloated stomachs, right? So anyway, the being... That, kind, that way, being bony and thin is what emaciated means. Thin and wasted. Not just being skinny because you went on a diet, then you wouldn't really be emaciated. If you had like anorexia and you went too thin and all your bones are showing, then you would be emaciated. So in the diagram here, um, it's probably no one... You know, no size there is considered really emaciated. But if we take the thinnest image there and maybe lost another 20, 30 pounds from there, that would look very emaciated. So basically, it is being very thin from starvation or illness. Furtive. Furtive glances. This is being stealthy and sneaky which means that you're like a thief and you don't want to be seen. And so a synonym for this is surreptitious, which we saw in Lesson 8. Do you remember the phrase? Yes, surreptitious peak, right? And that's the same idea with furtive glances, isn't it? It's about looking at something very quickly, thief-like, so you don't want, you know, no one will see you. Like a kid cheating in class and doesn't want the teacher to see him taking a peek so he'll be very surreptitious about it or he'll be furtive about it and the thing about the word furtive is that it's often associated with being like a thief so we would talk about furtive movements um, he moved through the shadows furtively things like that indolent indolent couch potato Indolent simply means lazy. So just use it as an adjective for lazy. Uh, there's some variations of it, uh, some from the dictionary. Let's take a look. A says, averse to activity, effort, or movement, like being habitually lazy. So a couch potato is someone who lazies around, uh, lazes around the, uh, the sofa and watches TV, someone like what you see in the picture. And that's a couch potato. And that's the definition we have in A. In B, we, say, we see conducive to or encouraging laziness. 
So the heat, indolent heat, some are heat can be indolent because it causes laziness in us. Or C, showing an inclination to laziness. You are likely to be lazy or you are kind of, you tend to be lazy all the time as in an indolent sigh. You let out a sigh that signifies that you're just kind of lazy and don't want to do anything. Miserly, miserly old man. When we think of miserly, well, the definition is stingy and mean in the sense that you're saving money and you're also mean about it. And that's what miserly is. And that idea, I think, is exemplified by none other than uh, Ebenezer Scrooge in Christmas Carol, right? So it's the person, uh, Ebenezer Scrooge, is called a miser. He's a miser. He's an old miser. And it is usually a mean character and also very stingy with money. Those kind of two characters go together when we say miserly old man. Preclude. Preclude the possibility. To preclude something is to make impossible or to eliminate but it implies that you make it impossible before it happens. You're shutting out the possibility before it happens, like um, cavity prevention, right? Uh, you have to prevent it ahead of time. You can't wait until your teeth start rotting. Um, pre here is before, and clued and clues means to shut. So the put together, the word really means to shut out something, the possibility, before it happens. So it is preventing something. And we might compare the words inclusive and exclusive, uh, which we've seen uh, earlier. And that means to shut in or shut out, right? And that clues is another root that you will see often in other words. Respite. No time for respite. This is an interval of relief or time of rest. Basically just a, a break time. Like a recess in school is a time of respite. Now, the thing to point out here is that the word is pronounced respite, not respite. It looks like it should be respite. And people who are not familiar with the word, when they see it, they will say respite because that's the normal way of reading English words. But uh, if you are familiar with the word, you would not do that. You would say respite. No time for respite. Taint. Tainted food. To taint something is to contaminate it or to cause it to lose purity. So it becomes dirty in some way. So usually food that maybe has been sitting around and becomes spoiled, you might say is tainted. If it comes in contact with something dirty, you might say it's tainted. You can talk about also tainted reputation, that someone's reputation has been dirtied or sullied somehow. And there was a famous song back in the 80s or so uh, called Tainted Love. And there's been, I think, several different um, versions of that. You, if you're interested, you might look it up on YouTube and listen to it. It's a very good song. Uh, I'm not really sure what it means, a tainted love, but somehow that love has been dirtied or contaminated somewhat is what I guess it means. Thanks for watching. That was lesson 13. I'll see you back for the next lesson. Hi, right, welcome back. We are halfway through our workbook now, going on to the second half with lesson 14. Adverse, adverse wind, adverse reaction. Something adverse to you is unfavorable or antagonistic. And it is related to the word from last lesson, adversary, because the roots are the same. Ad is to or towards you, and vert or verse means to turn. So something is turned towards you. In this case, it's not a person, but some condition that is against you, like the adverse wind. Is the wind blowing against you? So if a plane is flying, uh, in the air and the wind is adverse to the plane or the direction of the plane,
that travel would take longer? I think those are some common physics questions. Like you're you're on a boat and the river, if you're going upstream, then the current is against you. It is adverse. So it will take longer uh, compared to if you're going downstream, the water is carrying you also in the same direction. So it'll go, you'll go faster. And the other uh, definition we want to talk, talk about is the adverse reaction of drugs. Usually you take some drugs and there are side effects associated with the drugs then you call them adverse reactions, some reactions that are bad for you. Blasphemy. Thou shalt not blaspheme. That phrase is one of the Ten Commandments, I believe, and it is about cursing, irreverence, and sacrilege. It means that you're not supposed to say anything that insults God. That would be considered sacrilege. Sacrilege is um, anything that goes violates the sanctity of something, the holiness of something, and to use God's name is to do that. And the verb is to blaspheme, and that's what we have in the phrase. The vocab word listed is blasphemy. Now, often in our phrases, we don't use the exact same form because these are same words, uh, just in different parts of speech, and you should be able to recognize them as the same word and distinguish them with the different spellings so you use them correctly in, in usage as well. So in the Jewish religion, speaking of God's name is considered blasphemy. In the Muslim religion, Islam, Islamic religion, the drawing a picture of Muhammad, their, their prophet, the person that they worship, that is considered a blasphemy. And so they will get very upset about any kind of drawings, like cartoon drawings of Muhammad. There was a terror incident in France a while back because a particular newspaper, I, I think it was France, um, there was a particular newspaper that printed um, a cartoon and it depicted, delineated, we learned that word, right? Delineated an image of Muhammad in their cartoon so the Muslim community was very upset and someone went in and just um, uh, went into the newspaper uh, company uh, and uh, killed a lot of people because of it, because they felt that it was blasphemy against their God and their religion. So the picture image that you hear, have here is a comedy troupe called Monty Python, very famous uh, teachers really like uh, Monty Python. So... You might have heard of it uh, somewhere along the way. They have very funny skits. You might check it out on YouTube. This is a scene of a man getting stoned because he said, uh, this halibut is good enough for Jehovah, is what he said. He was having dinner and he really liked the taste of the halibut. And that was considered blasphemy because he said the word Jehovah, which is a name of God. So he's being stoned. And it's a very funny bit. So you can search it for uh, Monty Python, stoning, and that will get you to this video clip. Depravity. Depravity of criminals. Depravity is the corruption, the wickedness, or any form of evil is the depravity. So anytime you think of criminals and what they do, stealing, murdering, or, you know, any kind of harm, it's all depraved behavior. So that is the adjective depraved. And we don't want to confuse that word with the word deprived, as in not having something. Uh, deprived children are children who are not given something that they should have had, like love or Nintendo or something. If you didn't have something when you were growing up, then you were deprived of that thing. That's a different word, and it doesn't mean you're evil at all, right? Embellish. Embellish the truth, embellish the dress. To embellish is to adorn, to ornament. So it means basically to decorate something. Like a dress, a, the dress was embellished with lace. It was decorated with it. It was ornamented with something additional. So the other common usage is to exaggerate an idea. You would say after you um, lie about something, like exaggerate your you know, past history or whatever, your resume, you might say, 
Uh, I didn't lie. I just embellished the truth a little bit. Okay, and that just means I was exaggerating, so I was kind of lying, but not 100%. Garrulous. Garrulous old men. The idea here is loquacious, wordy, and talkative, which just means altogether they all mean that you talk too much, basically, and you use lots of words to explain anything. So imagine someone like that just kind of chatters on and on, okay? Imagine people, in this case, with a garrulous old man, imagine people sitting idly and chattering all day long. So the image I have uh, when I think of a garrulous old man is, uh, for some reason, uh, kind of a Western scene, and that's the image I have there for you, where the men don't have much to do, so they just kind of sit around. And uh, in my image, I have um, old men sitting in their rocking chairs, whittling. Whittling is taking a piece of stick and just kind of carving it with a knife, uh, carving it bits and pieces away. Sometimes they make a figure out of it. Sometimes just they just keep carving it until the stick is gone. And that's the whole purpose, just to idly, idly cut the pieces away. And while they do that, they're just kind of chattering on, on and on about, you know, all the meaningless, trivial things. And they're being very garrulous about it. Induce, sleep-inducing pills. These are your sleeping pills. And what they do is they induce sleep. They persuade you. They bring about sleep. So it is sleep-causing, okay? So a sleep-inducing pill causes you to sleep. The root here is deuce, which is to lead. And we see that in words like produce, introduce, reduce, etc. All these words have some kind of leading. So to induce is to lead you into something. And so a phrase or sentence, we might see something like this. The advertisement is meant to induce people to eat more fruit, to cause them, to lead them into. Or no one knows what induced him to leave, what led him to, what caused him to. Her illness was induced by overwork. The overwork caused her to get sick. And so this uh, image here is kind of funny because the sleep-inducing pill in this case is actually not just causing sleep in your stomach. It's actually persuading you by talking to you. You're getting very sleepy. So that's the joke. Now there's one more sentence. They will induce labor to avoid complications. Induced labor means when a woman is having a baby, she has to go into this stage called a labor uh, where she feels a lot of pain. And that's just before having the baby, um, having the birth. And so to induce labor, I think they would give her some medication or something that causes her to get into that labor state. Uh, that's when some women don't get into labor in, at the proper time. Misnomer. Indian was a misnomer. Indian, of course, was the wrong name or the incorrect designation, right? Miss is the prefix here, which means wrong, and nomer is name, and the nomer is not really important. So it is the wrong name for something. And we know the story of Columbus and how he was searching for the Indies and or India, they say, okay, so you get different different versions of the story. India or Indies, and he went and he found the Caribbean islands, I believe, and he thought he was in the Indies, so he called these people Indians, right? And uh, th that was a misnomer. Um, it was a name wrongly given to these people. Precocious, precocious child. Precocious child is very mature for that person's age. So if you have a five-year-old that talks like a 10-year-old or a 10-year-old that, talk, that talks like a 20-year-old, then that's a precocious child. The pre here means before, as we've seen many times, and coquere, to cook. Interesting word combination here. So what does it mean? Well, the child is fully cooked sooner than expected, basically. Uh, so you've fully ripened before your time. You're very early in that ripening 
is the idea. So when I think of a precocious child, I always think of child actors. All child actors have to be very precocious uh, because they need to, you know, be able to handle all their lines, memorizing and the situation, dealing with the stage and cameras and so forth. And so kids like Macaulay Culkin from Home Alone uh, were very precocious from the very young age, and that's why they were so popular. Resplendent, resplendent new clothes. That is dazzling, glorious, brilliant. Think of a fancy dress, a fancy suit, something like that. That would be resplendent. It is related to the word splendid and splendor, the splendor of something, the pizzazz, right? And you say, wow, that's splendid. It's great. It's excellent. Uh, this is all similar idea. We might see sentence like this. The fields were resplendent with flowers. It was glorious. It was dazzling with flowers. She looked resplendent in her green evening gown. She looked brilliant and dazzling. A bird with resplendent yellow feathers. The feathers are very dazzling. Tantamount. Statement tantamount to a confession. This means that the statement is equivalent in effect or value. So that means you made a statement to the police, but it sounded like a confession. It was practically the same thing. And that's what this phrase is, statement tantamount to a confession. It's not a sentence. It's not saying that statement is. It's a statement tantamount to a confession. Okay, Confession-like statement. Now, the photo here is of O.J. Simpson. You might not know this, uh, but I have to explain who O.J. Simpson is because these phrases were originally formulated back in the 1990s. And so you will come across many references to O.J. Simpson and Clintons and so on uh, because they, they were the main. O.J. Simpson was a big, uh, you know, current event of the time. Um O.J. Simpson was a football star, ex-football star, and then he, you know, did uh, small parts in movies and such, and uh, he was a very popular figure. Someone like, you know, like Michael Jordan or LeBron of today's time, I guess. Uh, very famous, well-respected. Uh, and then he, you know, he was uh, accused of murdering two people, his ex-wife and uh, the ex-wife's boyfriend by with a knife, cutting them up and stuff. Anyway, he was arrested for that. He was charged for that, and he went to trial for it. And that trial was broadcasted on TV live every day for a whole year. And so the world's attention was on this uh, one trial. And the biggest uh, surprise of, of all was that after a whole year of trial, when 90% of Americans believed that he was guilty based on all the evidence, he was acquitted of the crime. He was found not guilty, surprisingly. And it was all about racism and such. All right, so that's the basic story. We'll see OJ's name come up many times again. In relation to this story, about 20 years later, OJ Simpson either wrote a book or planned to write a book called If I Did It. And so he was going to talk about how he, in this book, he was going to say, I didn't kill them, but if I did it, he, and he was going to explain maybe how he would have done it and stuff. And so this book was like almost a confession that he actually did it, even though he's not saying he did it, but if I did it. So this is a statement tantamount to a confession. All right. Sorry for the long-winded ex uh, explanation. But the, the OJ, I just want you to know for future reference. Thanks for watching. That was 14, and we'll see you again in Lesson 15. Hello, welcome back. We're on Lesson 15 of our VQ Workbook number 1. Advocate. Lincoln advocated freedom of the slaves. So President Lincoln, of course, he fought for the freedom of the slaves, so to advocate means to speak or to write in favor of. It is standing up for someone and speaking for someone. Add here is a prefix, which means to or toward. We have seen that many times. 
And this looks like a new one, VOCA. VOCA means to speak, to talk, or voice. It is an important one. Please write it down and memorize it. So to advocate means talk toward something in a positive way. So the ad usually is some kind of a positive thing, positive attitude. Advocating for someone is speaking for them. And the person who does that as a profession is a lawyer. So a lawyer is called an advocate. Blighted. Blighted by the storm. Blight, blighted means suffering from a disease or being destroyed by something. And it comes from the word blight. A blight is a disease that kills plants and crops. So we might talk about the potato blight. Potato blight means there was a disease that killed all the potatoes, such as the potato famine in Ireland, you probably heard of. That would have been considered a blight. And we can say that about any other situation where things are destroyed or places destroyed, like from a bad storm, from a tsunami, a natural disaster of that sort. And we would say that it was blighted by the storm, which means it was destroyed by the storm. Deprecate. The teacher deprecated the use of slang. And that just means he expressed the disapproval of students using slang. So when you deprecate something, you're talking down that thing. And that's where the root comes from, uh, D. D is for down, we should know, down or away, right? And precari, which is not an important one, you don't need to uh, know that. Um, it is to pray, it's just interesting to note. So the archaic definition of this word is to pray against the something. So when you deprecate something like an evil, then you are praying against that thing. So when you deprecate the use of slang, you are kind of praying against it. It is a term also used in tech, as in software and other things. Uh, you, would, you might come across this word. It means that the software, some component or some feature is no longer supported by the company. And we say that it has been deprecated. So you might be using an app and you liked a certain feature uh, of the app and you upgrade and you find out that particular feature you liked has been deprecated. It means that it's still available, it's just the company will not support it or upgrade it anymore. Emulate. Emulate the tutor. To emulate is, it sounds like the word simulate, right? And it is kind of similar in the sense that you're copying something. So it is to imitate and rival but this is in a positive way. You're trying to imitate that person and you're striving to equal or excel that person. Have you ever seen a Kung Fu movie where the master says, well, when you can defeat me, then you can leave this mountain. You know, it's that kind of situation. The student will do everything he can to learn from his master. And when he decides there's nothing more to learn, then he can defeat the master and leave the mountain, go out into the world. And that's what you want to do when you're studying with a tutor or a teacher. You want to emulate your tutor, emulate your teacher, uh, not in the personality-wise, but uh, in terms of maybe speaking style, writing style, things like that. You want to equal their abilities, and that is emulating the tutor. Glutton. Gluttony is a deadly sin. A glutton is the person who eats too much, and gluttony is the noun for the idea of it. And so this idea of the deadly sin comes from a Christian idea of the seven deadly sins, or an old traditional you know, concept of seven sins. And so here we have an image of the seven sins listed. Those are the seven deadly sins, and this graphic is kind of making fun of the apps that we use, how these uh, programs, software, have trapped us within the seven deadly sins, like Netflix is sloth, which means laziness, or Twitter is wrath because you read a message and you get angry. 
That's wrath. Facebook, envy. You look at what your friends have and other people have and you get angry about it. And how about Instagram? Instagram is pride. People like to take selfies of themselves, of all the great things that they're doing and brag about it online so other people can see. And that is one of the seven deadly sins. Here's an expression that is commonly used. Um, it's, you're a glutton for punishment. You might hear this in a movie somewhere. Uh, it means you are hungry for punishment. You want to get more punishment, don't you, is what that means. And that will be equivalent to saying, uh, you're asking for it. You're asking for more trouble. Inert. Inert in bed or remain inert in bed. That means you are inactive or lacking the power to move. So if you're sick, you might be inert in bed. Or if you're feeling slow or sluggish in the morning, most of us feel that way when we have to wake up, right? We remain inert in bed for a while before finally get, getting up. Uh, this word is also used in chemistry. I'm sure if you've taken chemistry, you've heard of the inert gases, also called the noble gases. These are the elements with the greatest, greatest stability and extremely low reaction rate. Because they are uh, stable, they have complete outer shells, they don't need to react with other elements to exchange cells, I'm sorry, not cells, but exchange um, electrons with others, right? And so they are very stable, they're not reactive, so therefore they're called inert gases. Mitigate. Mitigate his anger. So to mitigate is to appease or to moderate. We've seen uh, several words like this, I think, like placate his anger, uh, mollify. I don't know if we've seen that one yet. Okay, and it means to make less severe. So to mitigate is taking some bad condition and making it less severe. So anger, of course, is a bad condition, and we want to lessen it, reduce it. And we can also mitigate aggressiveness. That's a negative quality. Or mitigate suffering to reduce. In law, you might hear this expression, mitigating circumstance, mitigating circumstances. That is some justification for breaking the law. For instance, let's say you stole somebody's motorcycle uh, and you are arrested and you are facing the judge and your lawyer, your advocate is defending you and says that you had a good excuse. Um, your grandmother was sick and you had no other way to get to her, but you needed to get to her, um, take her to the hospital or something. Uh, there was some special condition that made your crime less of a crime. Then that is a mitigating circumstance. Predator. Predators of the jungle. Predators, of course, are cre creatures that hunt uh, another animal. These are the fiercer animals that are catching others. So we talk about predators and prey, right? Predators. In this case uh, here in the picture, we see the eagle. Eagle eats the turtle, right? So eagle is the predator and the turtle is the prey. Adjective is predatory. Restraint. Show some restraint. Restraint is moderation or self-control, holding yourself back and controlling yourself. You might say this expression, show some restraint, when someone is just overreacting to something, getting wild. Sometimes kids do that when they are playing video games. They're on their a phone playing an app, a video game, and then they start getting excited and they start screaming and kicking things, then you will say to that person, hey, please show some restraint. Also, restraints, uh, generally in, in plural, but it could be singular, uh, something that holds you down physically. So a child restraint seat is what you see in the picture there. Those car seats are called child restraint seats because it it locks the kid into the seat. Also, the prisoner was placed in restraints, we would say. And that is if you put chains around the 
uh, the prisoner, then you are putting him in restraints. Temper. Temper your temper. To temper means to moderate, tone down, or restrain. And so your temper is your being angry, and you should temper your temper. These are different definitions we're playing with, right? So to temper with temper justice with mercy might be an expression we, we hear. Let's think about what that says. We're going to moderate justice with mercy. That means justice might be, you know, kind of eye for an eye. We want to punish that person with equal severity to what crime he has done. But we might want to temper that, tone that down by showing a little mercy below forgiveness and give them less of a punishment. Also, temper can mean to strengthen by heating and cooling. You've probably seen this in movies, um, an ironsmith making a sword. He heats it up to, you know, where the steel gets red hot, and then he dips it in water and bangs on it and then heats it up again. And that's um, basically how you get tempered steel. All right, thanks for listening. I'll come back and we'll go over lesson 16 next time. Hi, welcome back. We're on lesson 16 of our VQ workbook number one. Aesthetic, aesthetic value. The aesthetic value is pertaining to the sense of the beautiful. The beauty value of something is called the aesthetic value. And it is also spelled aesthetic with an E only, without the A. Um, I often see that uh, E spelling when it comes to uh, something about beauty treatments, uh, something to do with cosmetics and stuff. Um, they often use that aesthetic with the E. I don't know if there's a specific reason for it. It's just known as an alternate spelling. So we talk about the aesthetic value of something, like when you look at that building in the picture, uh, that building certainly didn't have to look that way. It could have been just a regular skyscraper, kind of a, a rectangular box, but they made it that way for the aesthetic purposes, right? Aesthetic reasons for doing it that way. And that's the aesthetic, aesthetic value of that building. We can also talk about the sentimental value of things. If you had a, say, um, a ring that was grand, given to you by your grandmother, uh, the ring itself might not be worth very much, but it certainly has a lot of emotional, sentimental value for you. Or we generally talk about the monetary value of something. If the ring is worth, you know, $20, then it doesn't have much monetary value. Bolster. Bolster the argument with facts. To bolster is to support or to prop up. So it could mean to hold up something physically, like, you know, uh, support beams uh, could be called bolsters in a structure. Or it could be to support an idea. You remember the word substantiate? The phrase is substantiate the claim with facts, right? And that's the same thing. Bolster the argument with facts. We're saying pretty much the same thing here. Uh, if you make an argument, an argument here, of course, is not fighting with someone kind of argument. We're talking about making an argument in an essay, an argument in a debate. It's some point that you're making is the argument. And when you make a point, then you should substantiate it with facts or you should um, bolster it with more evidence, more facts and details. It is also a term used for a long pillow or cushion kind of what you see in the picture image here. Deride. People derided Noah. To deride someone is to scoff at, to make fun of. That is just basically laughing at someone. The prefix is D, which is down or away, and rid, which means to laugh. And that is an important one, so please uh, write that one down. And we see that root in words like ridiculous or risible. Risible means laughable. And so to deride someone would mean you are laughing down that person. And of course, Noah was derided. You know why, right? Just in case you don't know, I'll tell you, Noah was told by God to build a large boat, an ark, 
Um, and he built it at the top of a mountain because he was expecting a huge flood that was going to drown everybody on earth. And so if people came around and saw Noah building an ark on top of a mountain, that seemed ridiculous. So they derided him. Endorse. Endorse the candidate. Endorse the check. To endorse the candidate means that you're supporting or approving of that person. The secondary phrase there is endorse the check, and that means to sign the back of the check as the recipient of the check. So the roots here involved are in, which is just in, and dorse. Dorse means the back, as in the dorsal fins of a fish are the fins on the back side. That's the dorsal side of an animal. So indoors, when you endorse a candidate, you are backing that person. You are pushing his back and supporting him up. So to endorse a candidate means publicly declare support for someone. Um, as in, the NRA can endorse Trump. In the image here, it says, why I endorse Bernie Sanders. That's an endorsing, supporting publicly. So the other definition of endorsing the check is, if I were to give you a check for $100, you couldn't just use it at the supermarket. You would have to take it to the bank and you want to change it to cash. In order to do that, you have to turn the check over and you have to sign your name at the back of it. Sometimes they would want you to write your bank account number or any other information. But signing the back, the dorsal side, is endorsing the check. And this is a step that is required for cashing a check. Gratify. She felt gratified by the praise. To gratify someone is to please that person, to make that person happy. So it is to be the source of some joy or satisfaction. So an experience can be very gratifying. You had a you went to the museum and you say that was a gratifying experience. Then you felt gratified by that experience. Infamous. OJ's infamous trials. Infamous means notoriously bad. And of course, uh, notorious is the synonym for infamous. It means famous in a bad way. And so the word famous is built into infamous in here for negative, not famous. But it's not not famous, it's famous in a bad way. So remember that, please. It doesn't mean unfamous. So here we have a picture of O.J. Simpson once again. Uh, O.J. Simpson, I think I explained in a previous video that he's a celebrity ex-football star, right? He was charged with a double murder. And his trial was broadcasted on TV for a full year. And finally, he was acquitted, which means he was found not guilty to everyone's surprise. All right, some points you should know. And why was this so infamous? Well, it was a terrible case of double murder. And it uh, was on TV for a whole year. And it had a lot of this racial issue of, you know, Americans' rac uh, racial discrimination kind of problem all involved in it. So it was like a daytime soap opera. It was a big drama and it had a lot of people's attention to it. And it became an infamous trial. Mock. Mock the teacher. To mock someone is to ridicule that person or to imitate uh, and mock, you know, to make fun of that person. Like when you repeat what the other person said, but in a mocking tone, right? often in derision. Derision is a noun for deride, which we saw earlier. Deride, derision. People derided Noah, right? Making fun. So it is any type of making fun, such as taunting or deriding or mimicking. You might have heard someone say, hey, are you mocking me? That means, are you making fun of me? Predecessor. Clinton's predecessor. The predecessor is the former occupant of a post. A post means a position, an office. Um, an office, not like a room office, but the position, political office, political position. The former occupant means the person who was there before this particular person. That's the former, the before. So pre here means before, 
and then D would be down or away. And we've seen those before. And seed and cess is also important, and that means to go. So predecessor is the person, the previous person, uh, actually, who goes away when you come in. Okay, he's the person before you who goes away when you start the new term. So when we look at all the presidents, these are the 44 presidents. And of course, President Trump is after this. He is the 45th president. Um, president Trump's predecessor is Obama. Obama's predecessor is George W. Bush and so on. And we use the phrase Clinton's predecessor only because he was the current president when this, these phrases were first formulated back in the 90s. So it doesn't matter who you choose for the phrase, but we'll just go along with a Clinton's predecessor because it really is arbitrary. It doesn't make much difference. Reticence. Reticence of the suspect. That is reserve and uncommunicativeness. Not communicating. So it means you're, you know, zipping your lips and talking or not talking at all. Okay, that's reticence. Re is back or again. And tack and tick, uh, this is the root we saw before. Uh, silent is the meaning, and that's in the word taciturn, as we saw earlier in taciturn cowboy. And reticence of the suspect means a suspect who is caught by the police, arrested, and questioned usually doesn't want to say anything because anything he says can be considered tantamount to a confession, right? We've seen that word. And so we don't want that. They, the suspect will stay silent or the suspect will stay reticent. Tenacity. Tenacity of the detective. The tenacity is the firmness or the persistence, which means he is not giving up on an old crime. He is going to keep searching until he arrests the person that he's looking for. So the root here is 10, and that is an important one. Please I'll write that one down. 10 is to hold, and we see this in a lot of words, like the tenant of an apartment is the person who holds the property for the time being. He doesn't own it, but he holds it. Being tenacious is the adjective for tenacity, so we say tenacious detective. How about retention? Your memory retention is how you hold things in your mind, in your memory. So we talk about retention, memory retention. How about detention? You get held back at uh, school, right? After school, that is another kind of holding. So imagine, uh, for the phrase, imagine a detective who does not give up on an old case. He goes on for 10 years, 20 years trying to catch the criminal, then he is a very tenacious detective. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Hi, welcome back. We're on lesson 17 of our workbook. Affable. Kids love their affable teacher. An affable teacher is very friendly and cordial, someone that uh, is very nice to the children, so kids all love that affable teacher. The root here, prefix ad, which means to or toward, that one you need to know. And the root fari, you do not need to know this one, but it's an interesting root. It means to speak. And these other words are built on it, like infant. Infant is someone who can't speak. That's a baby. Fable, fable originally, some kind of a conversation, some kind of a talk. And fate, fate is your life as already spoken before you are even born, spoken by God or the gods, whoever you believe in. Um, they have determined your fate, so it is a spoken fate. So affable, perhaps someone who is very easily approachable, someone you can easily speak to, might be an affable teacher. Braggart, my brother's a braggart. This is a simple word. It's a person who boasts or brags. And it just comes from the word brag. And it's the person who, bra who is bragging. So not the typical bragger as you might think of, but strange spelling, uh, A-R-T at the end. And so you get a braggart, but nothing really difficult about this word. Derivative, a derivative of the original formula. 
that means that it is unoriginal, that it is derived from another source. And that means when it's derived, it means it is taken from some specified source. And that's what derive means. So when we consider cola, for example, there are many brands of cola. Coca-Cola and Pepsi are the most famous, but there are many others. And those other less expensive brands probably have formulas that were derived from the original Coca-Cola formula. Not the, exactly the same formula, but something that was made from it. And so we say they derived from the original. And the noun form is derivation. And derivation is what we study all the time. It's the etymology. We're always talking about the derivation of a word. Where did this word derive from? And often it's from Latin and Greek. These roots that we're studying, uh, those are the sources, the original sources where these words, English words, derived from. And that's the derivation that we study. Engender. Confidence engenders success. So what does confidence do? If you have a lot of confidence, it causes or produces success. So it's very important to uh, boost confidence of young children because they'll get more confidence and that will make it more likely for them to succeed in the future. The root here is prefix n or m. It's the same thing. It means in and gen as in Genesis. And that's an important root. I write it down. It means birth, origin, or kind. You will see that many times later on. Genesis, um, genocide also. That is the murder of a kind of people. And so, engender, thus means to give birth to something. So, confidence gives birth to success is what we're talking about. Gratuitous. Gratuitous violence in movies. Something that is gratuitously given means it is given freely and it is unwarranted in the sense that there was no reason for it. There was no call for that, but it was given anyways. It was seen anyways. So what we should think of is movie scenes of lurid content that has no reason for being there. And we do see this all the time. There are movies that have gratuitous violence. The violence seems to be kind of unnecessary, but they're just to attract viewers and video games as well. There are a lot of video games that have, you know, it might be a simple RPG game, but because they can, now they add a lot of violence to it and a lot of blood and gory scenes to it. Because it interests some people, it might uh, attract more buyers. And then that's called gratuitous violence in video games. And we're always worried about gratuitous violence in movies, gratuitous nudity, um, any kind of, you know, this unnecessary stuff. And we put labels of parental advisory um, stickers on CDs and video games and such for that reason. Infer. What can you infer from the passage? To infer is to deduce or conclude as the listener based on what you heard. So the prefix is in, which means in, and furrow, which means carry or bring. That one is important. Please write that down. To fur, to carry in. So the meaning here is the message that you bring in after you hear some statement. And so it's not exactly what the person said, but what you can conclude based on what he said. And so we need to remember, like the graphic here, imply and infer are very different. It is the author who implies and it is the listener who infers. So if you ever wrote something like the speaker infers that, Generally, that's going to be wrong. You probably mean the speaker implies something and the readers or the listeners infer something based on what he said. So the question of what can you infer from the passage, that's a, a very typical question on reading comprehension questions on, you know, things like the SAT or any other reading or standardized test. 
it means the uh, in the reading, as you're reading it, uh, whoever the author is, the author didn't say it exactly, but based on the words that he used, you can tell. Um, and so you're looking for some something, a clue in the, in the reading, uh, but you're looking for information that was not directly stated by the author. Mollify. Mollify the angry customer. To mollify is to soothe the customer when he's angry. And so this is just like the word placate. Placate the angry customer too, right? Uh, basically the same thing. So you might say, mollify the staff with a raise. Well, the staff must have been unhappy. So the boss gave them all a raise and mollified them. Or you can say, mollified his anger. So you can hear, mollify the anger, or you can mollify the angry customer. Predilection. Predilection for classical music. The predilection is your partiality or preference. All right, you all know what preference is. I prefer this music over others. That's preference. Partiality, if you are partial to something, it means you favor one thing over the other. If you are partial to classical music over other kinds of music, it means you prefer that. So it's the same idea. Pre here means before, and the root comes from a word you don't need to know, diligere in Latin, and that means to love. So it's interesting just to note the derivation here, and that means thing that you love the most. You love this thing before other things. You prefer it, and that is the predilection. So we can talk about uh, someone's, you know, habitual way of doing something. And we would say, oh, that person has a predilection for talking back to the teacher. He is inclined to do that. Not necessarily that he likes to do it, but he's likely to do it. Or he has a predilection for telling tales. So that might mean that he's, he likes doing it or that he's very good at it. He's just very um, likely to do it and probably enjoys it. Retract. Retract his statement. That is to withdraw or take back, as in taking back something you said earlier. Re here is back or again, and the root tract is an important one, and that means to pull. So when you retract, you pull back. So it is to take back something you said earlier. And you have here in the image, it says New York Times forced to retract long-standing lie about Russian hacking. So New York Times does um, have to end up um, taking back a lot of the stuff they say. Um, and personally, I do believe that New York Times, CNN, all these other news outlets are fake news, just as President uh, Donald Trump claims them to be. They often do put a lot of fake information out there. So my sample sentence is also the New York Times printed a retraction. And usually the retraction ends up as a little, you know, tiny sentence at the end of you know, some other article or a reprint of a similar story. Tentative. Tentative plan. A tentative plan is hesitant and not fully worked out or developed. So it means it is kind of temporary and it is not finalized yet. So you might say the test is tentatively scheduled for Friday. If that's something your teacher tells you, then you say, uh, then you would know that it's probably going to be Friday, but the teacher hasn't decided finally yet. It's not for sure. So your teacher will tell you uh, again later about the exact date. It may or may not be Friday. That's the tentative plan. It could also mean being hesitant, as in the baby's tentative first steps. The baby gets up and not very certain of himself. He takes very Hesitant steps, those would be tentative steps. Good job. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Hi, welcome back. We're on lesson 18 of our VQ workbook. Affirm. OJ affirmed his innocence. Once again, we're talking about OJ Simpson, and he was the one that was charged with double murder, right? 
To affirm is to assert positively, to maintain as true. It is very similar to the word confirm when you confirm something. But here as affirm, you're trying to confirm some belief that you have, confirm some uh, idea that you're asserting. If you say it again, then you are affirming it. Now, the case for the O.J. Simpson is that when he was asked to plea guilty or not guilty, as all criminal suspects are supposed to do in court, they're supposed to just say um, guilty or not guilty. Now, those are the only words that they need to say, except O.J. Simpson stood up and he said, I'm absolutely 100% not guilty, Okay, which is something that no one ever does. And that made news because he did that. So it was a way of OJ's affirming, in a saying it in a very firm way, uh, maintaining this to be very true. And that's how he affirmed his innocence. Brevity. Brevity of a telegram. The brevity is the conciseness of words that you use. So think of it as briefness. The word brief means short, right? So brevity is basically briefness, the shortness. So what we have here is a telegram. This is maybe something you're not familiar with. This was before the telephones. Um, people across the country couldn't call each other. So what they would do is they would send these text messages of a century ago, basically. They would send a short message and it was transmitted from one place to another in the offices like Western Union Telegram office uh, where one operator I think they use Morse code and they will send all these beeping you know signals to uh, the other office across the country and the receiving uh, operator would write down the letters and it would come to a message like this they would charge by the number of words I think possibly number of letters I'm not sure I wasn't there so um, probably a number of words, I think. Um, and it was important that you kept your messages brief. So that brevity of a telegram is important. Today, it is uh, SMS text messages that we use. And we do have a limit on number of characters we can use. So we try to keep um, uh, those messages brief. So brevity in a text message is important. Despondent, despondent mood. To be despondent means you're depressed or gloomy. And that's basically it. You feel very sad, you're depressed, and so on. You're in a despondent mood. We can talk about how someone was despondent about his health. That's an example. You could be despondent about your grades, possibly. Or someone can become despondent after losing his job. Those would be some common uh, usage examples. Enhance. Enhance the program. To enhance something is to improve it. Or possibly to increase the level of something is to enhance. But usually improving, making something better. So you can enhance the flavor of some dish by adding herbs, uh, possibly with pictures. We use this word um, in computer photography and so forth. We talk about how we can digitally enhance the image. Or we can enhance the earnings for the year. That would be referring to a company increasing their earnings. So we can say that Apple enhanced their earning for the year with the introduction of the new phone, something like that. Gravity. Gravity of the situation. The gravity of a situation is the seriousness of the situation. It's nothing to laugh at because the situation is very serious. Like when you have a major fire, like what you see in the picture there, uh, that would be a grave situation. Uh, you might be thinking of gravity as in the force of gravity that pulls us down to earth. And of course, uh, that is really what we're talking about. Something that pulls us down and something that is heavy. Uh, emotionally is something that is serious, that pulls us down, it makes us feel heavy. Um, the antonym of the word gravity would be levity. The levity, like the levitation trick of a magician. A uh, magician would be on stage and he would lift the assistant up in the air, and that's called the levitation trick. 
the levity is about lightness. So that's the opposite of gravity. If you are talking about a very light situation, something comic and fun where everything is not serious at all, then we're talking about the levity of the situation. But uh, a serious situation would be called a grave situation, which is the adjective form of gravity. Ingenious. What an ingenious idea. Ingenious means clever and resourceful. So think of the word genius. So you're saying pretty much like a genius. So you can have an ingenious detective who has really clever ideas, uh, I guess, in solving a problem or ingenious contraptions. Ingenious contraptions is what we think of when we think of Home Alone, the movie. The child is very ingenious in, in the movies, right? The uh, child character um, and the child uh, is dueling with burglars. I guess that's at least in the first movie. I don't know about the other other sequels, but usually the child is making a lot of ingenious contraptions, little traps for the burglars. Morose, sad and morose. Morose means that you are ill-humored, sullen, melancholy, which is very similar to the despondent, despondent mood we're talking about. Um, you're being in a gloomy mood. So when you're doing the workbook, it might be a little confusing between these two words. Um, just try to think of the, uh, the phrases and try to work through them. If you're sad, you're morose, it's kind of a real depressed feeling that you're, uh, you're going through, the gloomy mood. Here's a sample sentence. He became morose and withdrawn and would not talk to anyone. Or those morose job seekers who have grown accustomed to rejection. So the job seekers have been rejected many times and over those many times, uh, they have become morose, very depressed in nature. Not very, not just a temporary thing, but uh, overall their whole mood for that period is very depressed. Um, so that's sad and morose. Presumptuous, presumptuous challenge. Here the definition is arrogant and taking liberties. And it, what that means is you're overstepping some due bounds, which means that you're being rude pretty much. So the idea of presumptuous challenge is that you are challenging someone um, in a kind of an arrogant manner. So if you're a student in a class and your teacher is explaining something and you challenge your teacher on that explanation, you say, no, your explanation about the aqueducts is wrong. I think I know better then you're being presumptuous and your challenge of your teacher's explanation is a presumptuous challenge because you're kind of being rude, you're being arrogant in your charge. Um, the teacher is supposed to be the one with the knowledge and you're a young student, so that would be considered presumptuous. The verb is to presume. When you presume, you assume that you can do things without asking pretty much. So here are some examples. Uh, the claiming that the teacher is wrong, that's an example of, you know, assuming you know better. That's presuming, presumptuous. Or you go to your friend's house and then you start looking inside your friend's refrigerator without even asking him. Then that would be kind of presumptuous. You are presuming that it would be okay. Or how about if you're borrowing things from your friends without asking first? You take a pencil, a calculator from their backpack without asking and you think that would be fine. You're presuming, you're assuming, and that is being rude and um, you're being arrogant. And that's what taking liberties is. You're being, you're freely doing things without thinking about it. Reverent, reverent worshipers. Reverent worshipers are respectful and worshipful. And those are the people at the church. All people at church are um, reverent people because they revere, and that's the base word for this. Revere is to show respect and honor to something. So we revere old traditions. We revere uh, things like our religion, the gods, you know, everybody, 
in the church, like uh, the minister, we revere the the minister. How about North Koreans? We hear uh, often about how North Koreans revere their leaders um, for three generations. Whoever the leader was, they worshiped the leaders as if these people were gods. And we use that word in that situation. So the person who is doing the revering is called the reverent people. That would be the adjective that's giving respect. The person who receives uh, deserving of that respect is often called the reverend, right? At church, the reverend or is the minister of the church, the pastor, the reverend, the minister. These are terms that we use for the person leading the church group, and he deserves our respect, um, kind of worshipful kind of respect. So therefore, he's called the reverend. Terse, terse and short. Terse means concise, abrupt, and pithy. And this is like brevity. Um, it means you're saying things in a very short way without wasting any words. So you're very using very few words, and that's the key idea. So you might give a terse reply to someone, say yes or no, and that's all you say. Or you might um, talk about a terse wit. That means someone is being very witty, but with very few words. He gave an answer to something. Uh, it was very few words, but it was very witty and clever. Or terse instructions. Your teacher might tell you to do something, but doesn't use very many words. Uh, gives you just a very short instruction. You're supposed to figure out all the details. What you see in the image here is called the magic eight ball. I don't know if they're still around. Um, it's a toy. Um, and you shake it up and there's a little... Uh, triangular pyramid shape thing in there that floats up you ask it a question you say oh um you know will i get a great christmas present this year and then you shake it up and then it'll give you definitely or possibly or some terse reply thanks for watching get your workbook at amazon.com if you don't have one Hi, welcome back to the VQ Workbook. We're on lesson 19. Agenda, morning agenda. Your agenda is your outline of things to be done. So if you have a schedule of things to do, usually at a meeting, you walk into a meeting and they'll hand you an agenda that tells you what things will be covered. So it's any kind of list of things to do. You can, of course, make up your personal agenda for your daily activities. Um, there is another definition uh, of an ideological plan. So we can talk about the political agenda or the Trump agenda. This means what that politician wants to do politically, kind of his plans that he wants to put into action over a certain period of time. There is also something called Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030. These are plans implemented by the United Nations. Uh, they make it sound really great. Agenda 21 was for the 21st century, so it's the 21. Uh, 2030, Agenda 2030 is the plan that they revised recently, and now this is the goal that they have set forth for the year 2030. On the surface, it looks really great, but there are a lot of problems with this, and I can't really get into it right now, but you might look into it. Just... Um, you know, go to YouTube and, um, you know, search for it and check out what it's all about. Cajole. Cajoled into doing all the work. So in the definition, you see the words coax and wheedle. And that probably didn't help you very much because you might not know what these words are either. They mean pretty much the same thing. It means that you're persuading someone to do something, but with flattery. So you're not forcing them to do it, but you're kind of tricking them into do it with your words. You sweet talk them into doing something. So uh, it could be to deceive with soothing words, basically. So the image here we have is, you might recognize it, a scene from uh, Tom Sawyer, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain, right? A famous story uh, where in the beginning of the story, there's this scene of Tom, who has to paint a fence as part of his chores, and he tells these friends uh, how much fun he's having, and he tricks them into giving him an apple so that 
they would get the opportunity to have this fun instead of him. So he kind of tricks them into uh, doing all the work. So it might not be exactly cajoling them, like sweet talking them into it, but he does deceive them. And it is kind of in that vicinity uh, of the similar definition. Despot, despotic ruler. A despot is the person. He's a tyrant or um, a harsh person uh, as a despotic. Um, basically a bad ruler with absolute power. So when we think of that kind of person, we think of Kim Jong-un in North Korea generally um, because he's the only one, a dictator of these days that we get to see a lot of on in the news. Um, so here are some other words that we commonly use. We call these people tyrants or dictator. Those words you might be familiar with. Also, autocrat is another word. Uh, autocratic, we would learn later. Authoritarian, as in authoritarian government. I don't think we covered that yet, but that is um, a word we will study. And also totalitarian. If you read a book like 1984 or... Uh, what else? Uh, Animal Farm, all these dystopian novels, or even Hunger Games, you would see that they have a totalitarian government where the government controls everything. And they are, if there is one person who rules, you call that person the despot or the despotic ruler. Enigma. He's an enigma. An enigma is a puzzle or a mystery. So it could be something or someone that is hard to understand. He's an enigma is something that we hear commonly uh, people say. It means that you're talking about somebody and that person is very eccentric, is very weird. So you say, hey, he's an enigma. We're not going to understand him. Here's a sample sentence. How the pyramids were built is an enigma. It's a big puzzle how that happened. So at this time... It's the idea is a puzzle. Gregarious, gregarious party goers. Gregarious means very sociable. You're friendly. You like to be with other people. So you go to parties. So all people at the party goers are probably very gregarious people. The root here is important. Greg, Greg is herd. That one you do need to memorize. Greg is a herd. So... If you are gregarious, you like to be in a herd, herd of people. The root Greg is used in a lot of other common uh, words like congregation, which means come together in a herd. A church congregation is that kind of group. Segregation. We talk about the segregation between the blacks and the whites uh, during the civil rights era and previous to it. Um, that is the segregation. That means to separate them into two separate herds. Also, aggregate is another word we'll study later. It means when you take the total of something, like you talk about the aggregate supply or the aggregate demand of the society as a whole. Uh, you're looking at the entire thing as one herd. Or egregious. We talk about an egregious error. That is something that sticks out of the herd. You have a herd of white sheep, but one black sheep sticks out. Well, that's something that's very noticeable. So an egregious error is that kind. So these are all words that you do need to become familiar with very soon. And they're all based on the root, Greg. Inherent. Inherent characteristics. The inherent parts are the firmly established parts, uh, established by nature or habit. And you, so usually um, it means that you're kind of born with it. These are characters that is natural to who you are and what you are. So it is the essential or natural characteristic, such as wood. Wood floats in water by definition or, or by the nature of what it is. That's an inherent characteristics of wood. We might say that man is inherently evil by nature. We're born with it. Or man is inherently good. And this is something that people argue about. Mundane. Talk about mundane matters. Mundane matters are worldly things as opposed to spiritual things. So nothing of the spiritual philosophical realm 
but of the worldly things that we see every day before us. The root is interesting. You don't have to memorize this one. It is mundus, which is the world. And if you speak Spanish, it is el mundo. El mundo is the world. And I can only refer to Spanish because that's the only one I learned in high school. But if you studied any other language, uh, other romantic languages, uh, you would probably find that uh, the world is probably similar to that. Because we're talking about things of the world, it often means things that are very boring and ordinary. So if you're watching a movie and the characters come out and they talk about what they had for breakfast and uh, how they're going to go to school and what homework they had, these are very mundane matters, very trivial daily things. And that's not really what you paid a lot of money to go see, right? So we don't want to see mundane matters. We want to see uh, superheroes fighting aliens and stuff because that certainly is not mundane. Pretentious. Pretentious teacher. Uh, nothing against teachers, but, you know, teachers tend to be somewhat like this at times. They might seem this way ostentatious or pompous. It means kind of being snobbish. And you can think of it as the word pretending. So the pretentious person is pretending to be superior to you. And I talk about teachers being this way, like arrogant or pretentious. It's just that, that kind of image because teachers are always dealing with children and he, they're always in the position of explaining things to them. And by nature of that activity, over the years, they tend to become kind of arrogant as if they know everything and they're always in the position of explaining to others. So if you are an adult and you meet a teacher, you probably find that they want to explain things to you still, even though you're not a student of theirs. Um, and so that that's kind of what makes them pretentious. The other part of the pretending part is um, teachers might come and talk about, because they're talking about their experiences, they might talk about the tr trips they had to Asia, to Europe, the wonderful things they've done, and uh, what kind of great experiences they had. And when they do that, it could sound a little pretentious, snobbish, because, you know, they're trying to make themselves sound really good, sophisticated, so on. So we can talk about pretentious language that people use, which is kind of snobbish, um, in the way they talk, they, they're going to use a lot of big words at you, so you might not understand them. You might talk about pretentious houses, where the house is very ostentatious, meaning very showy. On the outside, it's glitzy. It looks really fancy. Then we can call it a pretentious house. Rhetorical. Rhetorical skills in speech. Rhetorical refers to something to do with effective communication. It is anything to do with the way you talk and how you deliver your message. So in elementary school, you probably learned about rhetorical questions. These are questions that are not meant to be answered. So um, questions that are made for effect, but you're not trying to get an answer out of anybody. So you're often uh, starting your essays with questions, rhetorical questions like, like, uh, would you like to be a millionaire? Of course, everybody wants to be a millionaire, so you don't expect an answer to that. Uh, the rhetorical question, if you're like in high school and you're re using rhetorical questions, not really recommended because, you know, kids start doing that in elementary school. So it kind of makes you sound childish if you start that way, unless you have a really good question. Uh, I'm sure there are professional writers who would do that, but they wouldn't ask them you know, silly question like, would you like to be a millionaire? Uh, the better example for a rhetorical question would be, what the heck is wrong with you? All right. If I, if your mom or dad ever says that to you, they're not really asking you to answer the question. They're trying to say that you got a problem. The other part of rhetorical is the art of speaking or writing effectively. And so that's the art of rhetoric. Uh, that's the noun form. Threadbare, threadbare sweater. Threadbare sweater is shabby and poor. Basically, it's so worn that the threads are coming loose. So if you hear about a threadbare sweater, the idea that is that it's very old. Uh, it implies that you are very poor 
or perhaps you are very miserly, like the miserly old man we studied, or maybe you're a very frugal person, like the frugal gourmet, saves money, doesn't want to buy new clothes, then your clothes are going to be threadbare. Also, wearing threadbare clothing can be um, described with the word threadbare, as in, uh, he took in threadbare relatives. That means he was a wealthy man and he took in the relatives into his house and the relatives were all kind of wearing shabby clothes because they were poor. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next lesson. Hi, welcome back. We're on lesson 20 of our VQ workbook one. First word is alleviate, alleviate the pain. Alleviate is to lessen or to mitigate. That means to lessen some bad condition that you have. The prefix here is add, to or toward, which we have memorized, right? And levy, as in light. We saw this uh, root in the word gravity. Gravity grave is about heavy things and levy is about light things. And then we have eight, which is to make it that way. So to alleviate is to make something lighter. And that's usually some kind of pain that you have. You might relieve that pain, make it lighter, then you alleviate the pain. And the image here is for the Aleve painkillers. Um, that's a competitor, a competitor of Advil and Tylenol. I believe the name is related to the word alleviate or is supposed to make you think of the word alleviate. Although if they were doing it correctly by the the roots and the correct spelling, they should have two L's, then I would be sure. But in this case, they used only one L, but the meaning is the same. The idea is to alleviate the pain. Calculated. Calculated decision. And that is deliberately planned. Of course, you know what a calculator is. You use it all the time. So to have a calculated decision means it was very carefully planned as if you did it with a calculator, planning things out. So here's an example, a calculated attempt to deceive voters. And that would mean that the people in charge of the election or the politicians, they Calcul they made a calculated decision, calculated attempt. That means they planned it out ahead of time, uh, and it was an intentional deception of the voters. Or he took a calculated risk, meaning that he knew what he was getting into. It was risky, but he had planned it out and he thought about it. He calculated all the pros and cons to it. Detached. Feel detached from his family and that is to be emotionally removed, or you're calm and objective because you're not emotionally attached to it. So it is the opposite of attach. We have attach and detach. We can talk about how you attach or detach things physically, as in using a scotch tape or um, a Velcro. You can attach things together, put them together, or pull them apart and you detach them physically. And so we can also talk about the emotional attachment and detachment. Uh, you get a puppy and you get very attached to that puppy emotionally. And later on, you get detached emotionally apart. Enmity. Enmity between the enemies. The enmity is the ill will or the hatred. And we use the word enemies because it looks similar to enmity. Uh, most of the letters are the same. So it shouldn't be too hard to memorize this phrase, enmity between the enemies. We can look at some sample sentences. There's a long history, history of enmity between them. Long history of hatred, rivalry, kind of ill will between them. His comments earned him the enmity of his co-workers. Okay, well, whatever he said, it caused the other people to feel hatred toward him. Um, and one more, we need to put aside old enmities for the sake of peace, our old hostilities, our old feelings. Guile. Guile and deceit. Guile is deceit, duplicity, wiliness, some kind of trickery and deception. 
Um, and so here in the image, this is a character, the guy there. I don't know who the girl is, but the guy is a character named Guile. That was his name. And this is a character from Street Fighter 2, a very famous game, but back a couple of decades ago. And it's in there because back when we originally made up the phrases, the original phrase for this word was Guile used Guile to defeat Ken because just about everybody at that time knew what this game was and they all could relate and they could imagine Guile, the character, and was very useful. But as time passed, nobody knew what Guile, who Guile was anymore. I'm sure you probably don't. Um, and so we had to change the phrase in this case. Guile and deceit. This guy uses trickery, deception, maybe uses weapons that he's not supposed to. Then he is using guile. Here's a sample sentence. A person so full of guile, he can't even be trusted to give you the correct time of the day. Okay. So he's just lying all the time. He's always uh, deceitful. He's full of guile. Innate. Innate talent for music. If something is innate, that talent is inborn or inherent. We have seen the word inherent, which means that you are born with it in the sense that it is part of your characteristic. But the word innate is more about the being born with it because the in is in and the root nat here is about being born, the birth. So we talk about the native people that uses that root. And when we talk about the nativity scene during Christmas, that is the birth of Jesus we're talking about. That is the nativity that we celebrate. So the nat is about being born. So innate is more about how you're born with it. Inherent is basically the same, but it's more about the characteristic that is um, natural to that person or that object. So there is a slight difference in, in nuance when you're discussing different things. Munificent. Munificent benefactor. And that is being very generous. And, and what word did we see that was very generous? I think we talked about uh, benevolent. Benevolent priest, did we? Benefactor. What uh, what was the priest that we talked about? Magnanimous priest, wasn't it? Yes. So when you want to think about it, you got that idea in your head and you want to think about it, you know it was something about a priest, um, and you do exactly what I did. Think of the priest. You know there was an adjective in front of it and try to recall that phrase that you memorized because it should come out together as one word. What was the phrase? What was the word before priest? Something priest. And we have very similar words. So I have different words running in my mind, but you should have thought of magnanimous priest right away. And we talked about how magnanimous means big hearted. That is very generous. Uh, freely giving. That's what munificent is. So you can have a munificent donor who gives money very freely or a munificent gift, that is, a very generous gift. And benefactor, of course, I think we talked about it before, is a bene, good, fact, uh, to do person. So a person who does good things, like philanthropist, right? Donation by the philanthropist. And you also know the word altruistic, altruistic donation. So these words are all related. Prevalent, prevalent view. Prevalent view is the widespread view, the generally accepted view. So the prevalent view is the prevalent attitude of the society at that time. So in the picture here, yes, we see protesters against Donald Trump because that seems to be the prevalent attitude among a lot of uh, young people. It's just uh, what's out there and what seems common and you, should, you feel like you have to go along with it because... Uh, part of it, peer pressure, I suppose. Uh, prevalent custom is the custom tradition that is prevalent in that culture that is very common. It's an accepted custom. Prevalent teaching method, maybe, like the Montessori method used in um, you know, kindergarten classes. Uh, that is a particular teaching method, and that might be the prevalent method of the time. Prevalent fashion among teenagers. 
in different eras, teenagers do different things. There was a time when um, all the boys and the girls too, they used to walk around with baggy kind of pants or loose pants and show their underwear as part of their fashion. I never understood that. I don't know if kids are doing that still. I haven't seen much of it lately, but these are the fashion fads. It was a very prevalent thing at the time. Rigor, rigor of military training. The rigor is the severity, the harshness, how difficult and strict that thing is. So, of course, when we think of military training, we think of that as being very harsh, harsh conditions, such as the rigors of life in the wilderness. If you went out into the wilderness and you were on a you know, survival tour or something and you had to survive on your own, uh, that would be very difficult. Uh, it would be very rigorous for you. Or we can talk about the strictness of some condition, as in they conducted the experiment with scientific rigor. So this, this we're talking about scientists in a lab who are doing experiments and they're being very rigorous, meaning very strict, strict with measurements and cleaning and all those details, uh, scientific rigor. I'm sure there's more to it than, than cleaning, you know, uh, vials and stuff, but uh, basically... Uh, how strict they are is the rigor. Thrive. Bees thrive in the summer. To thrive is to prosper and to flourish. It means you grow very well. So you are growing vigorously. You can talk about plants and animals growing vigorously. Like this sentence, the plants thrive with relatively little sunlight. They grow very well. Or we often use the word to talk about the economy. The economy is thriving under President Trump. So we can talk about, uh, you know, those different kinds of uh, situations where everything seems to be growing and prospering and everything's energized and things are thriving. Thanks for watching. I will see you back here in the next video. Hi, welcome back. We're on lesson 21 of our VQ book one. Aloof, aloof at parties. To be aloof means you're at a distance, reserved or reticent. We studied the word reticent, reticence of the suspect. That means not willing to talk, right? Uh, being reserved means that you are not, you're kind of holding yourself back. So this is the idea of being the loner at a party. And that's what a wallflower is. The expression that you're a wallflower means that you're at a school dance and you're just standing against the wall, just watching everybody, not really engaging with anyone. So that's the movie we see here. I haven't seen this particular movie, so I don't know what it's about. But the idea of being a wallflower is that being aloof at parties. Candor. Thanks for your candor. Your candor is the frankness, being totally honest and freely speaking your mind. And that is being candid, honest, and sincere. So many years ago, there was a TV show called The Candid Camera. In this show, this is a, a hidden camera show where they would uh, set up these practical jokes on people with hidden cameras around to show their reactions. It could be celebrities or regular people. We just wanted to see the candid reaction from the people when they thought they weren't being filmed. So that's the idea of the candid camera. When you would say thanks for your candor is in situations when people are uh, being too honest with you and it seems a little rude for them to say it, but they're being honest. So if someone says to you after a speech, hey, your speech was boring. Well, it's not very nice, but at least they're being honest. And that's when you would say, hey, thanks for your candor. And that would be your answer. Oh, well, thanks for your candor. Deterrent. Death sentence deters crime. A deterrent is something that discourages. It discourages a particular action because it makes you think about it. Death sentence, if you have a death sentence for a particular crime like um, murder, of course, can be punished by death, then people think twice about committing murder. So even if they're hurting somebody, they would stop before they end up killing the other person because of that potential punishment that they're afraid of. 
So that punishment has the effect of deterring or preventing a particular crime. So logically speaking, we could institute a death sentence for all crimes, couldn't we? Then we'd be free of crimes in society. For example, bicycle theft is punishable by death, you say. Well, that would seriously, dramatically reduce bicycle theft, I'm sure, because people will think twice about um, stealing bicycles. And that was the case with um, the Old West. The theft of someone's horse was punishable by death. And so anybody would feel free to leave their horse just strapped to a post somewhere and just walk away because they would be sure uh, that no one would come and steal the horse. No one wants to risk their life for a horse. And so that punishment had really that deterring effect. Well, what about, say, drug offenses now? Would you want death sentence for drug offenses? Well, that is something to debate about. President Trump has mentioned this that um, some countries, I think maybe Philippines, um, they have the drug, uh, death sentence. Some countries have death sentence for drug offenses, as in dealing drugs. A major dealer can receive the death sentence. It would definitely have the effect of deterring that particular crime. Enunciate. Enunciate every syllable. That is to speak distinctly, to pronounce everything very clearly so that the other other person can understand every syllable with, of what you're saying. And in order to do that, you need to move your mouth a lot. You need to move your jaws. Um, you know, it's typically the case that a lot of young people don't do that. They, they kind of mumble to themselves. They expect the other people to understand. But it's good practice at a young age to enunciate everything that you say. And uh, as you grow up, as an adult, you'll speak more clearly and you'll be better understood by other people. The root here, nuntiare, is the Latin. We don't need to know that, but we should make note of the, the nuns, N-U-N-C, root that appears in so many words. The unnounce, we talked about this before, unnounce, pronounce, denounce, renounce. All these words have the idea of uh, reporting something, saying something. And that's what enunciate is related to. Enunciation is the noun, just like pronunciation, denunciation, and renunciation. And I hope you remember still the words denounce, denounce the crime, I think we, we did, and renounce, renounce. She, she renounced her beliefs was her phrase, was the phrase that we memorized. Gullible, don't be so gullible. A gullible person is someone who is very easily deceived, like a child that will believe anything you tell the child. Uh, that person is easily deceived, and you say, hey, you're so gullible. So we often find that tourists in a new area can be gullible, and so there are a lot of con men, um, tricksters, who come, come around just to trick the tourists out of their money. So what happens is if you're a gullible person, you're easily tricked. And if you're tricked many times over and over, then um, as you age, you become more cynical. And we learned that word, right? Cynical writer, a person who distrusts everybody. And it's just kind of nature of growing old. Innocuous, innocuous error. Innocuous means harmless. So you're looking at something that might be harmful, but you decide that it is not as harmful as it might be. So something that has the potential of being harmful and you decide, hey, it's harmless. So the prefix here is in, meaning not, and it is related to the word noxious. So if it's innocuous, it's not noxious. It's not harmful or toxic. So we would look at some peppers like this habanero peppers, they look pretty innocuous, right? They are innocuous looking habanero peppers. They look kind of like small tomatoes. It looks pretty yummy, but they are very spicy. Nefarious, nefarious villain. Nefarious means very wicked and evil. So it's a word adjective that you use in front of someone like a villain or the kind of actions that a villain, a bad guy would do. So you can talk about a nefarious scheme to cheat people out of their money. 
Well, if you're cheating people out of their money, that would by definition be nefarious because you're cheating people. How about a chaste heroines, the chaste heroines, and the nefarious villains of old time melodramas? So the chaste her heroines would be the female hero characters who are very pure, very good, versus the very evil villains that are very stereotypical of old movies and stories. Prodigal. Prodigal son. The prodigal son was very wasteful or reckless with money. So someone who wastes all his money is being prodigal. And in order to know the phrase here, prodigal son, you need to know the story of the prodigal son, which you, every, everyone should. All English-speaking countries um, use a lot of references to the Bible. So even if you're not a Christian, you need to know this Bible reference. It was a parable of Jesus. Jesus told these metaphorical stories. And in this particular story, the son, there were two sons. And one of the sons, maybe the older one, asked the father... Um, before the father died, uh, his father is still alive. The son goes to the father and says, well, you're going to give me your inheritance when you die. Can I have that inheritance money now? Father says, fine, take all this money, do what you want. And the son goes away to a different country and he wastes all the money. So he was prodigal in that sense. And after he squanders all his money, he is left um, just in squalor with nothing. He, he has to work as a slave to another, you know, other people just to survive. And so he decides instead of being a slave to another person, I might as well go back to my father and be a slave in his household. That would be better than anything else. And he comes back, returns to the father and the father surprisingly welcomes him back. Um, and that's the idea of this entire story. And metaphorically, the father here is God and the uh, son, the prodigal son, is the lost soul that comes back to God. And that uh, the idea is that the lost soul would always be welcomed by God. Robust, a robust young man. Robust means very strong, basically, very vigorous, full of energy. So you can have a lot of different strong, energetic things like a robust debate. How about a robust coffee, a uh, very strong coffee, or a robust dinner. That would be not really strong dinner, but a hearty meal with lots of food. That would be a robust dinner. Tirade. Teacher's lengthy tirade. Also pronounced tirade by some people. I don't think it really matters. You can say teacher's tirade or teacher's tirade. I think it's about, um, you know, equally used out there. And what does it mean? It means the teacher's extended scolding, denunciation. And uh, you've probably gone through this. There are times when a teacher gets very upset in class. Maybe he caught half the class cheating on a test. Then he goes into this rage and just kind of Maybe he's not screaming necessarily, but he is yelling at everybody at how wrong they are and all the bad things. And he's scolding them, but not for just a minute. It goes on and on. Seems like the whole period is spent for him to uh, give this tirade, tirade at the students. So we can talk about a tirade of vulgar language. That's when someone screams at another person using lots of curse words and vulgar language, then you might call that a tirade of vulgar language. All right. Thanks for watching. That was lesson 21. We'll come back for lesson 22 in the next video. Hi, welcome back. We're on lesson 22 of the VQ workbook number one. Number one is altruistic, altruistic donation. Altruistic is the un selfishly being concerned for others. It means you care about other people because the root here is alter. Alter is an important root. Please write that down and uh, memorize alter as other. Um, the, it is the root that, that means other. The English word alter means to change. So they're spelled the same, but when I say alter, I'm usually talking about the root meaning other. And that is the root found in the English word alter 
or alteration, which is also the noun for change, or the alternative, which is another choice, the other choice that you can go to. The noun for altruistic is altruism, and the person who does this is an altruist. So when we talked about the philanthropist, philanthropist gives donations. So by definition, he is an altruistic person. Capricious, capricious storm. Capricious means being fickle or incalculable. As in, it's hard to predict what, what that person is going to do or what that storm is going to do. Uh, because the storm is being very fickle. It's on, off, it's here, it's there. So when you watch the weather report, they often talk about the capricious storm. The noun that it's based on is caprice. Caprice is being um, whimsical, kind of acting uh, on whim based on whatever you feel like doing at the time. And that's a lot of children, a lot of little children behave that way. So we say that they're being capricious. We can talk about capricious winds or possibly something like Lady Luck is a capricious mother. And that's just a, some expression. Um, it means that luck in life is very capricious. You can't really rely on it. Detrimental. Detrimental to your health. Something detrimental, of course, like cigarettes, is very harmful or damaging to your health. So we can talk about the detrimental effects of a lot of different things. We can talk about the detrimental effects of pollution or possibly the factory's waste was detrimental to the local environment. So anything that is harmful to the people is detrimental. Ephemeral, ephemeral life, short-lived or fleeting is the definition. It means it's not going to last. It's very short-lived. Uh, time is limited. Our life is ephemeral uh, because we're here for a temporary time and it's really nothing compared to, say, the you know billions of years that the Earth has been around. So that our life is very ephemeral. We can also talk about ephemeral pleasures Um where you go, say, you go to Disneyland and you enjoy the rides, uh, but it's very short-lived. That's an ephemeral pleasure. Ephemeral fever. Fever that you have, but it's only temporary. It goes away after a short time. Hackneyed. Hackneyed plot. Hackneyed plot is defined as commonplace or trite. And if you look up any, either of those words, It'll probably tell you that it means hackneyed. So you kind of go back and forth without learning really what it means. Uh, it means that you're lacking in freshness or originality. And that means you're saying things that are that have been said many times before. There's nothing original about what you're saying. And the idea of a hackneyed plot is a movie plot. Um, you go to see a movie, uh, say something like Avengers. Avengers, there's so many movie, Avengers movie coming out. It's like one every year or so, right? Basically, uh, the plot is pretty much the same. You got some bad guy showing up and the Avengers get together. Uh, they have to fight against the bad guy, defeat the bad guy, so on. Um, the plot is pretty hackneyed. It's very trite. It's kind of, kind of old and nothing fresh and new in that. So we can talk about hackneyed slogans, slogans that people say or businesses say that seems kind of old and stale. Uh, or you can talk about hackneyed stereotypes, stereotypes about certain groups of people that seems uh, very generic and nothing new or creative there. Innovation, innovation and technology. The innovation is any kind of change or introduction of something new and the idea of new is important there because the prefix is in, meaning in, and the root is nova. Nova means new. Um, and that is something you want to remember. Please uh, make note of it. Um, and so innovation has to be something new, a new change, uh, not just any change. So we see the root nova in novel, not the book novel that you read, but when you say that's a novel idea or the novelty of something, it's the newness of that thing. 
We also see it in the word renovation. When you renovate a building, then you are making that house new again. Negate. Negate the argument. That means to cancel out or to nullify or to deny. Of course, as you guessed, it is related to the word negative, right? Um, to make something negative is to make it opposite. So to negate the argument is basically saying the opposite of someone's argument to cancel out that person's argument by saying the opposite or proving or disproving the other person's argument. So we generally talk about negating an equation, right? If it's um, you have an equation and your teacher tells you, well, let's put negative signs in front of each term. And if we negate the entire thing on both sides, then it'll stay the same. That's negating the equation. Um, we can also say alcohol can negate the effects of some medicine. What does that mean? You take medicine um, for the effects and then you drink some alcohol. That alcohol can actually cancel out the effect of the medicine. So you end up as if you didn't even take the medicine. That's the negating effects. Prodigious. Prodigious strength. Prodigious strength is marvelous, enormous strength. It is like being a prodigy. Prodigy is something wondrous, like a really a genius child is called a child prodigy, something of a wonder. And we could use that same idea in a lot of other situations when you have something like strength in the picture here. That's the classic uh, picture of Samson in the Old Testament, who is strong enough to push the pillars of the stadium and bring the whole stadium down. And that is really prodigious strength. It's not common human strength. Magicians perform the pro prodigious feats. Feats are acts, actions. Um, so we're talking about magicians on stage doing things that seem humanly impossible. A prodigious supply of canned food. If you're you know, setting up a bunker for a disaster, then in your shelter, you might uh, stock it with maybe five years worth of canned food. Then that will be a prodigious supply of canned food. Ruthless. Ruthless murderer. Pitiless and cruel. Yeah, I know the picture. The guy in the picture doesn't seem so ruthless. But hey, who knows? Sometimes the more ruthless they are, you know, they might come to you smiling like that. Ruthless means that you have no Ruth. Ruth is compassion or remorse. It's related to the word rue. Uh, when you say, when you hear somebody say, hey, you will rue this day. That means you will regret this day when you treated me this way. You will regret it. And that's Ruth, um, regretting kind of uh, th that kind of feeling or feeling compassion for another person. So if you are ruthless, then you feel no compassion for anybody else. And that's why you're a murderer. I think by definition, a murderer has to be ruthless. Um, the opposite would be ruthful. You could be ruthful and that would be you're full of compassion. You're a very compassionate person or you're being very sorrowful. You're full of rue, full of regret. Torpor, torpor of a hibernating bear. Torpor is lethargy, sluggishness, or dormancy. Lethargy is what you feel uh, after a heavy meal. You're feeling kind of tired and drowsy. You don't want to move. You don't want to do anything. That's lethargy. That's the sluggishness. Dormancy, being dormant, means you're sleeping. And of course, a hibernating bear is sleeping. And if you wake it up during the winter, then it would feel very lethargic, very slow. It would be feeling torpor. And so torpor is the noun form of torpid. Torpid is the adjective, just the basis of this word. A sample sentence might look something like this. The news aroused him from his torpor. His torpor was him being just kind of lazy and um, not really uh, feeling anything. And then he heard some news, something good or bad, whatever it was, it excited him or it got his attention and he got up out of his torpor. All right, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Hi, welcome back. We're on lesson 23 of our VQ workbook.
Ambiguous. Ambiguous answer. Ambiguous means having several possible meanings, usually two. It could mean yes or it could mean no. It could mean two different things because a the root there is ambi. Ambi means both, which we have seen before, as in the word ambivalent, when we say she felt ambivalent, she felt both love and hate. Or if you are ambidextrous, it means you use both of your hands equally well. If you're an ambivert, it means you're both an introvert, a shy person, and an extrovert, which is an outgoing person. If you have both of those qualities, then you are an ambivert. So ambi ambiguous, the word we have here, means two possible meanings. Of course, it could be more than two, but usually it's two. The noun form is ambiguity, ambiguity, I'm sorry, that would be the right pronunciation. We, uh, you might hear about ambiguity in grammar. This is a grammatical error that you should be aware of in sentences like this. Joe told Bob that he couldn't go. And the, when you look at the pronoun, he, we call that an ambiguous pronoun because that he could actually be Joe saying, I can't go. Or that could mean Bob uh, with Joe saying, hey, you can't go. So it could be interpreted either way and that leads to ambiguity in the grammar. Caricature, caricature of the president. A caricature, I'm sure, is, you know, is a distortion. Burlesque is another word to describe this kind of distorted art form. Um, if you go to a county fair or a theme park, there's an artist who would draw these pictures for you. And the key characteristic is that they would exaggerate certain features of your face so that anybody looking at the picture would recognize it as you because you have those distinctive characteristics like the President uh, Obama's uh, portrait here. Uh, this, is the, this is typically how he was portrayed in any kind of political cartoons or caricatures um, with the very short hair and the very big ears because that was his unique feature. So any kind of exaggerated and ludicrous distortion. Ludicrous means it's really um, kind of outrageous and funny. Devious. The devil's devious ways. Devious means going astray or erratic, not behaving correctly, right? We've seen that word. And cunning, as in being um, deceitful and cheating. So the prefix here is D, which means down or away. And via, via is way. So if you deviate, you're going astray from the straight path. So you're being devious. So you are wandering. You're going on a devious path, a path that goes astray, aside from the main road. And it could also refer to people being cunning and deceptive, like a devious politician or a devious trick. Erroneous. Erroneous answer. Erroneous is mistaken or wrong because it's basically built on the word error. It's the adjective for error. Then you have something that is erroneous. The root there is er. Er is to wander. E-R-R. -R. Anytime you see E-R-R, -R, you should think of the word error and going astray. So we can talk about erroneous assumptions as an example. When you assume things that are not correct, that's erroneous assumptions. Or we can talk about erroneous impressions. As in, you saw somebody and you had an impression of that person, but it wasn't the correct uh, understanding of that person. It was wrong impressions. Hamper. Hamper the progress. To hamper means to obstruct or to block the path. So it is a synonym to impede or disrupt or stymie. These are some other words that all mean kind of getting in your way and kind of uh, slowing down your progress. We would see a sentence like this. The project was hampered by lack of funding. Yeah, you had a big, maybe the city had a big project for construction, but there wasn't enough money. So then it was, the project was hampered. It was slowed down. The accident is hampering traffic on the freeway. There's a car accident that is blocking everybody else, then it's hampering the traffic. Insipid. Insipid design. Insipid means lacking in flavor and dull. As in insipid food, uh, that would mean there's no flavor to that food. It's very bland. 
You can talk about insipid prose uh, that is writing that is kind of dull, nothing interesting. And usually good writers do not write in insipid prose. They write in very kind of uh, flowery, creative ways. They have creative ways of expressing the same thing that you and I might say in a very insipid manner. That's why they become the authors of books that make a lot of money. The insipid design idea is um, like a wallpaper you might see. Um, and the wallpapers are generally kind of boring and dull. And so we would say that's an insipid design on that wallpaper. Nonchalance. Nonchalant about his grade. Nonchalance is the noun form. It means indifference, lack of concern, and composure. So you feel indifference, which means not caring about it. Either way, you don't you don't like it, you don't dislike like it, you just don't care. That is the lack of concern. We have a sample sentence like this. Uh, we could say he was surprisingly nonchalant about winning the award. All right, so he won a award. He should be happy, but he seems nonchalant. He doesn't care. She faced the crowd with the nonchalant ease of an experienced speaker. There's a big crowd, but this person goes up and speaks to the people. She's not nervous. She doesn't feel anything. So this is the kind of the composure idea in the definition. She feels very composed. Um, she's very calm about it because she's nonchalant. Profane. Profane the name of God. To profane the name of God is to violate or desecrate, as in blasphemy. Thou shalt not blaspheme, we said. That is profaning the name of God. That is to violate the sanctity of the name of God. It is the same word as profanity, the noun form. When, uh, when you use vulgar language, we say you're using profanity. So profanity. Profaning is generally for um, religious situations. You profane God, profane something sacred, but profanity can just, um, it could be that religious aspect or just you using bad language. Adjective is profane. Uh, for example, we can talk about um, situations like the upside down cross that people wear around their necks and on their necklaces or as their earrings. Why do they do it? It's just plain profanity. They're trying to profane the Christian religion that way. Um, or an example that I find particularly interesting is the statue of Buddha used in restaurants as restaurant decorations. Uh, Buddha in the Western world might look kind of exotic and kind of funny, interesting, but it is a deity, virtually a deity of another religion with, you know, a billion followers, and it's kind of interesting that Westerners are willing to profane uh, this deity of another culture. Um, can you imagine? You go to China, and they have um, Jesus Christ being the decoration of a Chinese restaurant, or you know that kind of situation. We would consider being very profane. Sage, consult the sage. Sage is a wise person, so if you need advice, you would go to a sage. Um, but a sage is generally wise through experience, so it implies that it's someone old that you go to. So we generally imagine an old person, a wise old person of the village that everybody goes to for advice. But generally an old person. Adjective is sage, so you can say sage advice. I need some sage advice. Tranquility. Tranquil waters. Tranquil waters is waters that has calmness and peace. Very peaceful. Uh, no ripples, no storms, no nothing. Everything is calm. Then there's tranquility. Synonym. Placid is a synonym. Uh, being sedate is a synonym. And Pacific, as in Pacific Ocean, it means uh, peaceful. So all these words refer to being very calm and serene. And the word tranquilizer, of course, is related to it. Tranquilizer is the, uh, the shot that we give usually to an animal. When you see like an animal loose and someone comes along and, um, you know, animal control person comes along with a gun that shoots out a dart that has 
I guess they call it a tranquilizer dart. Um, it has the tranquilizer medication uh, chemicals in it so that when it hits the animal, the animal is sedated, uh, drugged, and then falls asleep. Uh, so if you have a person who is very um, excitable, excited for some reason, going hysterical, the doctors might give that person a tranquilizer as well. Okay, that's the end of this lesson. I'll see you back for the next video. Hi, welcome back. We're at the penultimate lesson for this workbook. The word penultimate means second to last. So this is lesson 24, second to the last lesson. Ambivalent. She felt ambivalent. Ambivalent means feeling uncertain. I think I mentioned this word when we were looking at ambiguous. And um, I think I went through it quickly as if we studied it already. Sometimes I get confused on which word comes first and second. These words and phrases, they're just all floating in my head. So I get confused. So if I ever go over something that uh, you haven't seen yet, it's the word that you're going to see very soon. And that's why I mention it. And so the root here is important, ambi for both. And that's the word we saw, uh, the root we saw in ambiguous, right? So we might have, um, for example, the feeling of love and hate together. She loves it and she hates it. Then she feels ambivalent. Like you studying vocabulary, you might feel ambivalent about it. You love learning new words, but you hate doing all the, the drudgery of the homework and watching the videos and stuff. Then you feel ambivalent. Um, you might see a sentence like this, that she felt ambivalent about her demanding father, which is love and hate at the same time. Or sometimes you feel just uncertain about a situation. She felt ambivalent toward marriage. She loves the guy, but she's not too sure about be getting married to the guy. Then she is feeling ambivalent. Censorious. Censorious church groups. Censorious means being very critical of things, telling you that it's too, it's really bad, so you shouldn't watch it. So it's based on the word censor, which means to not allow something, not to be confused with censure, which is just to criticize something. So we can talk about an uncensored movie. A movie at the theater is usually uncensored, but when it comes to television, they usually cut out a lot of the bad things, like bad language that shouldn't be said on TV. Then that's, an, that's a censored movie. Then you can go to the DVD store and uh, buy a DVD that says the uncensored version or the director's cut, and you'll get the full movie. We also talk about internet censorship, where a lot of big tech giants like Google, YouTube, and Twitter, these big companies are cutting the um, access of certain speakers. A lot of conservative speakers are getting their platform removed because the companies don't like what they have to say. Then we refer to that as internet censorship. These companies are being censorious. And when we say censorious church groups, it's the idea that uh, a lot of church groups tell their youngsters not to engage in certain behavior, like you know, don't watch, don't listen to this kind of music, it's too violent or it's too evil, don't watch these kind of movies or even these cartoons, um, you know, like Disney movies, they have bad influences on you. And when they do that, um, they're being very censorious. Devise. Devise a plan. To devise is to think up or plan something, like getting an idea or discussing it with people and coming up with a plan is to devise something. So some examples here, you can devise a strategy, strategy for marketing, strategy for attacking the enemy. You're coming up with that idea, the plan. Or to devise a new method, you come up with some new method, innovative idea, you're devising it. Or to devise a new scheme, a new plan. Erratic, erratic behavior. Erratic behavior is odd and unpredictable behavior, also based on er, to wonder, which we saw in the word erroneous. And this is all to do with having errors. So we can talk about an erratic comet, comet that is 
not following a you know a predictable path but it's kind of moving this way and that that's being erratic uh, erratic dieting you're on a diet program but you're not consistently on it you're doing it in a fitful manner maybe that's erratic dieting or the computer is behaving erratically you would say it's giving you problems and you don't know it's being very unpredictable doing odd things that's the erratic behavior of the computer hardy hardy plants hardy means being sturdy and robust like the robust young man being very strong and vigorous right weeds are what we think of as very hardy plants because they can grow just about anywhere without any care so we can talk about a hardy spirit, a spirit, a person who is very bold and brave. We can talk about hardy soldiers, um, soldiers who are used to hardships. So they are very weathered veterans and they're experienced in that way. Insolvent, insolvent business. An insolvent business is bankrupt or unable to pay its debts. So it's out of money, basically. We can say that the company is solvent. Solvent means making money. Or the company is insolvent. And that means the company is losing money. It's one or the other, pretty much. I guess right in the middle, if it's not making money or losing money, you, you do have the option of saying that it's breaking even. That's the expression. When you don't make money or you don't lose money, you're just right at the edge where just everything pays for itself. Breaking even. Notoriety, OJ's notoriety. So OJ, once again, uh, is famous for his murder trial. The notoriety is his disrepute, the reputation in a negative light, or the ill fame, fame in a bad way. That's the notoriety based on the word notorious. Notorious means infamous. And I think the phrase was the same, OJ's infamous trials. Um, it's famous in a bad way. Notorious means also famous, but notorious can be just not as bad. It's just very well known for something. Uh, not particularly good, but just kind of well known, um, becoming publicized for something usually negative. He achieved instant fame and notoriety with the release of his film. So in that sense, uh, that notoriety is being famous, not necessarily really bad, um, but it's not very good either. Profligate, wild and profligate companions. Being profligate is dissipated, wasteful, or wildly immoral. So what we're talking about with the phrase here, wild and profligate companions, is um, some friends that your mother doesn't want you to hang around with. Your mother tells you, oh, those kids, they're bad influence on you. So stay away from those kids. Those are the profligate companions. There's something wicked about them, immoral about them. So it could be wildly extravagant for one thing. You are wasteful with your money, as in profligate spending. Or you can be shamelessly immoral as in profligate life, all the bad things that you can think of, drinking and drugs and, you know, things like that. They're living a profligate life. Sanction. Sanction the new policy. To sanction means to approve or to ratify. And this is talk usually in the government level, the government of United States sanctioned something, um, the Congress sanctioned something. Uh, it means they approved it. So we say the government has sanctioned the use of force. Government approves of it. Or his actions were not sanctioned by his superiors. Well, whatever he decided to do, let's say a police officer, you know, beating a suspect, that kind of behavior was not sanctioned by the police department. It was not an approved action. Also, it has another definition that we hear a lot. It's a military or economic coercive measure. So what you hear on the news a lot is that there, there were some economic sanctions placed against North Korea or sanctions against Russia. We talk about, we hear about it all the time. It means that the government of the United States wants to punish North Korea and make them behave differently or punish Russia for something and make them 
you know, change their attitude about something, then we put economic measures in place, like uh, not trading with them or not allowing ships to go into that area at all, things like that. Those are some sanctions um, that are intended to coerce their behavior to make them, you know, do things that we want them to do. Transient. Transient guests at a hotel. Transient means momentary and temporary. It means you're passing through. So we can talk about the transient beauty, beauty that is just kind of short-lived. Um, you know, you're, you're beautiful. Everybody's beautiful when they're young. And then as you age, that transient beauty goes away. We can talk about transient visitors. Any visitor, by definition, should go away soon enough. So they are transient visitors. Also, another definition, if you call somebody transients, transients on the road, uh, on the streets, we are talking about the homeless people, and we're, they're called the transients. All right, thanks for listening. We'll come back and study the final lesson in the next video. Hi, welcome to the final lesson of our VQ workbook number one. This is lesson 25. Analogous. Analogous situation. It's a situation that is corresponding in some particular. That means it's similar to some other situation. So these two situations are similar or comparable. It comes from the word analogy. Analogy is a comparison of relationships or similar things. In the old SAT exams, there used to be questions that were called the analogy questions, and it looked something like this. A car is to a driver as an airplane is to what? Of course, an airplane is controlled by a pilot, so that would be the right answer. So we're seeing the analogy between the relationships of the vehicle and the manipulator and the vehicle and the manipulator. That's an analogy question. So when you think of an analogous situation, you might think of, say, a martial arts class, and that is analogous to a school classroom because you have an instructor and you have a lot of students who learn from that particular instructor. Censure. Teacher censure the student. This is to blame or criticize, to say that you've done something wrong. It is not censor, S-O-R, which we saw in censorious church groups. A censor is to cut things out and tell you not to see it and not allow you to see it. Uh, that's to censor. This censure is just criticizing. So usually open or official condemnation. When a politician is being um, censured by the government, government body, it means that the, the governmental body, like the Congress or some kind of assembly, is making it official. They're making an official record of the fact that they criticize some person. That's an official censure. So we might see a sentence like this. The lawyer received a letter of censure from the judge. The judge had something to say, something to criticize about, and he wanted to make it official, so he wrote it in a letter and sent it to the lawyer. A rare censure of a senator. Senators are very high-ranking people, and they usually don't get censured for anything they do, but it does happen sometimes. Um, the, the Senate would decide that this person has to be criticized openly, and so they would censure the senator. What does it mean? Is he going to go to jail or prison for it? No, nothing really happens. It's just something on your record. Like you get a bad uh, mark on your school record and it stays on your transcript or it stays on your permanent record, we say, right? And that's going to hurt your chances of getting into college later. It's basically that effect. Didactic. Didactic puzzle. That's a puzzle that has teaching and instructional goals in mind. So we're talking about puzzles like the kind you would get from your social studies class in elementary school or junior high. You get like a crossword puzzle of all the geographic locations and stuff. Um, that puzzle is not for fun. It's intended to be instructional. So we would call that a didactic puzzle. It's related to an interesting word, um, autodidact. Autodidact is a self-taught person. 
So if you don't go to college, university, instead you read a lot of books and you learn all these, you know, high level things by yourself, then you are called an autodidact. Equivocal, equivocal answer. That is ambiguous and unclear. We've seen ambiguous before and before both. So ambiguous answer is like yes or no is kind of unclear. Unclear. Here we have the root uh, equi, equi means equal, and voca, which means voice or call. Those are important. Please make note of that. So uh, the meaning for equivocal means giving equal voice to both answers. You're giving equal weight to yes and no at the same time. So the word ambiguous may or may not be intentional. Maybe you just spoke in a very unclear manner, then you made an ambiguous answer. But equivocal implies that you're intentionally being ambiguous. Uh, usually politicians do that. Politicians don't like to give a straightforward answer because that's whatever answer they give, uh, there's going to be people who don't like that answer and they're going to alienate those people. And politicians don't want to alienate anybody. They want everybody to support that person when it comes election time. So they will often give equivocal answers. Haughtiness, haughtiness of the cheerleaders. Haughtiness is the pride or arrogance that is being haughty, the adjective. And so this is nothing to um, criticize, you know, nothing against cheerleaders in general. Uh, this is only in reference to the movie stereotypes of cheerleaders. When you watch teen movies, a lot of times, they show different groups of people in a high school and the cheerleaders become a stereotype of this kind of attitude. Uh, they're the popular ones. They're the more arrogant ones. They're very cliquish. They only, you know, hang around with themselves and they're kind of mean to a lot of people. Um, and that's the kind of impression we get ingrained with about what cheerleaders are. And that idea is the haughtiness of the cheerleaders we're referring to. Instigate. Instigate the people to revolt. To instigate is to urge, to start, or to provoke. And it is just like the word incite when we saw inside a riot. When you instigate, you are causing other people to do something. And here we said revolt. For inside, we said riot. It doesn't matter. It's the same idea. Violence instigated by gangs. So the gangs caused violence to happen by, you know, arousing other people to get involved. The government has instigated an investigation into the matter. They have started it. They've put it into action. Novelty. Novelty of a new toy. That is the newness of that toy. Something new is the novelty. It's based on the root nova we saw in innovation. Nova is new. So the adjective is novel, as in the phrase, a novel idea. That's a new and interesting idea. So novelty of a new toy, whenever you get a new toy, and even my dog, my dog gets a new toy, he's happy with it for a day or two, and then after that, the novelty wears off and he doesn't care anymore. Profound, profound idea. Profound means very deep, not superficial, not just on the surface, or it is very complete and thorough. A profound sigh, that would be very deep sigh, I suppose. Um, like, it's, it's not a, just a breathing issue, but something that shows a lot of grief, a lot of emotion. That would be a profound sigh. Or if you're in a profound sleep, that would be in a deep sleep. Well, generally, we are talking about things like profound insight, which is a very deep insight into an issue. Satirical. Satirical humor is mocking. And that's kind of a limited definition. There's more to it. Uh, satirical humor is something that is using a lot of wit, irony, or sarcasm. Uh, these you know, rhetorical devices to deliver this message. And the message is that you're going to make fun of somebody or some institution. So let's look at some examples of satire. So satire is a story 
that is intended to poke fun at something, to ridicule something. Uh, Animal Farm is a story about animals having a rebellion against a farmer. And this is a satire against the you know, Russian Revolution, communism, totalitarianism, you know, things like that. So it is not just making fun, but uh, criticizing you know, through this story, this creative, witty story. Gulliver's Travels is also a very um, important satire. It's the story of the giant regular man who goes to the land of small people, right? But it is a satire. The entire story is a satire of England and the the British monarchy and how they are at war with Fr- with France for years and years. Uh, there's a lot of things that Gulliver encounters in the land of Lilliputians um, who are doing things in a very silly, ridiculous way. And each one, each detail is meant to make fun of the British monarchy. How about the story of Don Quixote? That's the old man, the knight who goes, you know, charges evil monsters, but in fact, he's fighting windmills and such. Um, the whole story is kind of a satire of uh, this romanticization, romanticization, I guess. Uh, of making romantic stories out of all the violence that's involved in the knights going around killing people for honor when it's just, you know, a lot of slaughter for no reason, very trivial things. And that's what uh, Don Quixote gets involved in. And I'm sure there are other layers of it, you know, against the government and things. But this is all just very witty, uh, a critical, you know, commentary about society done through sarcasm and irony. Trepidation. Feel trepidation about the interview. You feel uh, fear, nervous apprehension. You feel worried about it. So it's from the word trepid. Trepid means fear. You're timorous, like shy, timid, kind of. And you're fearful of the situation. What if you're intrepid? That means the opposite. You are fearless. An intrepid attitude means you're very brave. You're daring, audacious. So if you feel trepidation about the interview, that means you have like a job interview the next day and you're feeling nervous about it all night long. All right, congratulations. We have completed book one. And uh, if you have been working through these words diligently and working through the, the workbook, I am sure that you probably recall over 90% of the words. If you see the word, you should be able to say the phrases and you will remember them for, for a, quite a long time um, if you've done all the work correctly. Now that we're done with this, please finish your lesson. And please, after you finish that, please make sure to go to the website and take the post test and see how well you remember the words. All right. Thank you very much. And I'll see you in the videos for book two of the vocabulary quotient workbook.